Good morning. I'd like to call this meeting of the uh, Capital Investment Committee for May 4th to order. We do have a quorum. And therefore, um, Representative Eklund, have you uh, looked over the minutes of April 25th? Then would you care to move them? Thank you. If I have looked over the minutes, Mr. Chair, and I will move them. Thank you. Those in favor, say aye. 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 The minutes are once again prevailed. A couple of college presidents. Okay, uh, obviously today people are here for a reason. Uh, apparently we've got something on the agenda that draws more than our normal agenda. And uh, so we'll just move right along and uh, try to do the uh, the best we can to move through the this. Message for uh, the first the item, uh, I would like to, uh, I will make a motion to uh, move this uh, bill to Ways and Means. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Carried. Uh, and now, uh, Representative Hanson, I, I, after I do the move the delete all, I'll come to you. And uh, then I would like to. Uh, Thank you. My number here. I would like to move uh, 4404, uh, the delete all amendment to it. Uh, lab labeled A5. Any discussion on the delete all, which gets me where I want the bill to be? What? Oh, first mistake of the morning. The amendment labeled A18 dash 0869. So you're all looking at the right document. So I am moving the uh, author's amendment, my amendment to 4404 labeled as A18-0869. Discussion, Representative Hanson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And before we vote on this, I need to uh, disclose that there is a provision in here that uh, is not mine, but uh, it provides funding for a trail that, run, that would run adjacent to my property. Thank you very much for that notification. Uh, any other discussion on the amendment? What was the number again? What was uh, seeing none, those in favor say aye. aye. Nay, the ayes prevail. All right, so uh, now we'll do a overview of what we have, uh, starting with the spreadsheet, Mr. Lee. Mr. Chair and members, in your packet, there should be a uh, portrait size spreadsheet that looks like this. Uh, starting with the University of Minnesota, the total uh, appropriation for the University of Minnesota is 78,533,000, with 40 million for asset preservation, 10.533 million for Greater Minnesota Academic Renewal, uh, 24 million for the Pillsbury Hall Renewal, and four million for Glen Sheen Asset Preservation. For Minnesota State Colleges and Universities, uh, the total is 122 million uh, point eight five eight, of which 27.6 million is user financed, and 95.239 is geo bonding. 40 million is for asset preservation, 22.5 million is for Bemidji State, 22.8 million is for Rochester, a community and technical college, 6.4 million is for MSU Mankato, uh, 569,000 is for Anoka Ramsey Community College, 6.362 uh, million is for Century College, 12.636 uh, is for Normandale Community College, uh, 628,000 is for Minnesota State uh, University at Moorhead, and 698 is for uh, Inver Hills Community College, uh, 10.1 million is for Riverland Community College. Uh, moving to the Department of Education, the total is 47 million, of which 2 million is for library construction grants, 25 million is for school safety grants. Um, <laughs> 14.492 million is for the Red Lake School District, 
five million is for Atwater Cosmos Grove City School District for an elementary school uh, purposing, and six hundred thousand in general fund is for the Warward School District for the Northwest Angle School. Uh, under the State Academies, two million for asset preservation. Under the Department of Natural Resources, the total is. 62.75 million with 30 million for asset preservation, 20 million for flood hazard mitigation, 6 million for acquisition and betterment of buildings, 2 million for improving accessibility of state parks and recreation areas, uh, 750,000 for Glendrino State Park, uh, 1.5 million for Bluffland State Trail, or for the Bluffland segment of the Harmony State Trail, 1 million for the city of Cohasset. Uh, for a uh, trail and recreation area and 1.5 million for the Millax uh, East ATV loop. Under the Department of Pollution Control, 20 million, uh, 20.3 million for um, total, 6 million for the uh, uh, Waste Disposal Engineering uh, Closed Landfill Program, 7 million for Clay County for re the Resource Recovery Center, 7.3 million for the Redwood Cottonwood Joint Powers Board for Lake Redwood Reclamation. Uh, under the Board of Water and Soil Resources, 15.781 million, of which 10 million is for uh, RIM Reinvest in Minnesota, 5 million is for Local Road uh, Wetland Replacement Program, and in a grant to political subdivision, uh, 781,000, and it's for the city of South St. Paul for Seidel's Lake. Under the Rural Finance Authority, uh, 35 um, million in user finance loans <coughs> for the um, Rural Finance Authority, uh, 10 million for the Minnesota Zoological Gardens for asset preservation. Under administration, 16 million is the total appropriation, 5 million is from uh, CAPRA, 1 million is for capital memorial uh, repairs, and 10 million is for capital security upgrades. Under the Department of Military Affairs, uh, 4.45 million for St. Cloud a mechanic, um, uh, 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 mechanical envelope repair um, of that building. And under public safety, uh, the total is 22.5 million, and these are all grants to political subdivisions, with the first being 9.9 .9 million for Cottage Grove, 6.6 .6 million for, the Deco for Dakota County, and 6 million for the city of Marshall. Under the Department of Transportation, the total appropriation is 114 million point one four one. Um, for the uh, local road uh, grant program, the undesignated program is 72.321 uh, .31 million. Um, in the specific grants, there is 13.5 uh, million for the city of um, Dayton for the Brockton Interchange and 6.1 million for Invergrove Heights for Argenta Trail. Uh, then there's a project that is split in two parts. Uh, the general fund portion is, um, and this is both for uh, Hennepin County's uh, CASA 9 and I-494 Bridge Project or Rockford Road. Uh, 5.36 million is from, gen or from uh, GEO bonds and 5.36 million is from the trunk highway bonds. Uh, for Ramsey County uh, Railroad Separation Project, um, I believe this is uh, pre-designed design, uh, one million in geo bonds. And finally, uh, <coughs> there's a trunk highway project, railroad separation uh, in Pope County on trunk highway 29 at 10.5 million. Under the Metropolitan Council, the total appropriation is 20 million, 10 million for Metro Regional Parks, 5 million for inflow and infiltration grant um, two million for the city of New Hope for a uh, 50 meter pool, three million for the city of St. Paul for the walk on TV Center. Under the Department of Human Services, 54.65 million in total, the total appropriation, of which 10 million is for asset preservation, 6.75 million is for the Anoka uh, roof and HVAC replacement, uh, and 25.1 million is for grants for uh, regional mental health crisis centers. Under the grants to political subdivisions, 10 million is for the city of Minneapolis for the family partnership, 1.9 million is for Scott County for the crisis center, or for a crisis center, and 900,000 in general fund is for White Earth for the, an opioid center. 
Uh, under the Department of Veterans Affairs, 10 million for asset preservation. Under the Department of Corrections, 24.65 million is the total appropriation, of which 20 million is for asset preservation, 2.7 million is for the St. Cloud Interior Perimeter Fence, uh, the second phase, and 1.95 million is for Moose Lake Control Room renovation. Under the Department of Employment and Economic Development, 87.719 is the total appropriation, of which 3 million is for uh, BDPI, 10 million is for Transportation and Economic Development, and 2 million is for IBDPI. Under the Grants to Political Subdivisions for Austin, uh, Public Television, 2.85 million. Uh, for the City of Brooklyn Park for Second Harvest, 18 million. Uh, in general fund cash spending, 6.9 million for the city of uh, Duluth for the Superior Street STEAM project. 1 million for Hennepin County's Children's Theater. Um, uh, 514,000 for Idaska County for radio infrastructure for the radio tower and 290,000 for uh, the city of Jackson for a memorial park redevelopment. Uh, 1 million or 100,000, excuse me, in general fund for the city of Litchfield for an opera house, <coughs> 15 million for the city of Minneapolis for the Upper Harbor Terminal Redevelopment pro uh, Project, 500,000 for Pipestone County for the Dental Center, th um, 3 million for the Polk County uh, North Country Food Bank, 1.765 million uh, for the city of Silver Bay for the Black Beach Campground, um, 4.5 million for St. Paul Conway Center, um, six point, or so, excuse me, 2.7 million for the Saint, City of St. Paul for the Humanities Center, um, 2.5 million for the City of St. Paul for the Minnesota Museum of American Art, and 8.1 million uh, for the City of Wabasha for the Eagle Center, and 5 million for uh, the City of White Park for the Quarry Redevelopment. Under the Public Facilities Authority, the total appropriation is 120 million, <laughs> uh, of which 20 million is for state matching grants for the US EPA capitalization grants, uh, uh, 55 million uh, divided between uh, water infrastructure for the um, clean water program and the drinking water program, um, and uh, of which uh, 3 million is uh, specific for the uh, grant to the city of Wyndham. Um, then under the wastewater infrastructure point source implementation grants, 45 million. Uh, under the Minnesota Housing Finance uh, Agency, 6.7 million for public housing rehabilitation. Uh, for the Minnesota Historical Society, the total appropriation is 40 million, 30 of which is for the Fort Snelling uh, Visitor Center. Uh, and the spreadsheet says design, but it is actually construction. Um, and then uh, 10 million for historic sites asset preservation. Uh, and then the next few lines are for the Minnesota Management and Budget for bond sale expenses, 890,000 for the geo bond sale and, and 20,000 for trunk highway bonds. Uh, in Article 2, there is an additional appropriation for uh, MHFA um, uh, Infrastructure bonds, these are appropriation bonds, and the total authorization for that is 550 million. Uh, then in the next few lines are the totals under the various funds. Uh, the net geo supported is on, or the total uh, geo supported is on line 223, and then there is a cancellation of uh, unspent portion of a previous bond authorization for the city of Bloomington for Lindau Lane, that's on line 225. And so the net total uh, for GEO supported is on line 227 at 825 million. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lee. Any uh, questions of Mr. Lee? And, uh, Ms. Dyson, the next portion, please. Uh, Mr. Chair and members of the committee, um, in your packet also there is a bill summary uh, that looks like this. And if you, uh, on page one of the bill summary, section one uh, covers what I, some people call the boilerplate, I call it the rules of the bill. And um, I would flag that for everyone to be aware of what covers the spending in article one. And then I will proceed to article two. And in the bill summary, that begins on page five. And in the bill itself, it's on page 37 and begins with, um, the uh, section one is amending the statute that governs grants to political subdivisions um, to uh, strike an obsolete uh, subdivision that was repealed in 2009 and then adds a 
portion of a sentence to reflect uh, language that is also in Section 1 of Article 1 relating to grants to political subdivisions. Uh, the uh, Section 2 is relates to the Hazardous Materials Rail Safety Program that was enacted last year and adds relocation of publicly owned utilities to what can be paid for under this program. On uh, page 6 of the bill summary, page 38 of the bill, uh, the exemptions, this is the state building code and exempts the House and Senate chambers door locks from the state building code in order for um, the House and Senate to install door locks that will meet the body's needs. Section 4, beginning um, on the lower half of page 38 of the bill, uh, this is the uh, point source implementation grant program and it adds a new subdivision relating to supplemental grants um, and the first paragraph of that, you'll see that um, a grant is not awarded under this subdivision unless there is a specific amount appropriated for the purposes of this subdivision, so that an appropriation generally for the point source implementation program um, without reference to this subdivision uh, does not uh, trigger this subdivision. And then the uh, new language will apply if the, um, if the combined sources of funding from WIF and the point source program and any other funds is less than 50% of total project costs or the amount needed to reduce the annual cost per household for the wastewater system in the project area is no more than twice what it is in the metro area. Um, and this is for uh, greater Minnesota cities. Um, section five on page 39 of the bill. Um, this is um, again just requesting the PFA to provide estimated cost needs for WIF and point source implementation. Section 6, beginning on page 40 of the bill and uh, going through uh, page uh, 42, this is the housing infrastructure, housing infrastructure bond authorization through the Minnesota Housing Finance Agency. <coughs> and it adds a definition of senior housing. It authorizes uh, senior housing and manufactured home parks to the purposes for which um, housing infrastructure bonds may be um, issued and used, and then um, provides some criteria for prioritizing comparable pro proposals for senior housing. The additional authorization is $50 million, and the debt service in Section 9 um, on page, um, I think it's on page uh, 43, you'll see the language related to the additional debt service paid from the general fund is $2 million in fiscal year 2021 um, and then in fiscal year 2022, $4 million per year to pay debt service on the additional $50 million authorization. Beginning on four, page 43 of the bill and uh, section 10 of article 2 are changes to prior uh, appropriations in bonding bills, um, beginning with the 2009 appropriation for veteran cemeteries. Um, and I believe this provision was in the governor's bill um, and it allows for uh, seeking funding for capital improvements, extends the availability of the money to 2022, and or the end of 2022, and then provides that federal reimbursement for design uh, and pre-design of the veteran cemeteries can be used for asset preservation at veterans homes after the design is completed for cemeteries in Redwood, St. Louis, and Fillmore counties, um, instead of all legislatively uh, authorized veteran cemeteries. On page 44, um, again from the governor's bill, there is an amendment to the 2014 appropriation for the <coughs> Minnesota State Academies that allows um, the um, unspent money from that year to be used for asset preservation. Uh, on page uh, 45 of the bill, section 12, um, the 2014 appropriation to Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board for the Brian Coyle Community Center is extended to 2020. Um, and then on page uh, 46 of the bill, there is a uh, change to the 2015, uh, 2014, I'm sorry, um, appropriation for Rice Lake and what this is, uh, Rice Lake incorporated in uh, as a city in 2015. So this is correcting it from being a town to being a city and then ex uh, extends the availability. Section 14 on page 46 of the bill is amending a 2014 uh, appropriation for the St. Cloud State Prison Project to allow money that remains from that appropriation to be used for the uh, project that was authorized last year uh, and extends its availability to 2020. The uh, section 15 of the bill on page 47, uh, local road 
Improvement Fund Grants is allowing the 2015 appropriation for the Wilmore Y to be used for pre-designed design, design right-of-way acquisition and engineering as well as for construction of the roads. Section 16 on page 48 of the bill uh, is the State Trail Recreation Area Park and Acquisition Development correcting the 2017 appropriation. Um, this was, uh, it's just a change, correction of the dollar amount. It doesn't change any authorizations or um, actual spending that was possible. So. Um, page, uh, where does this go? Page 50, uh, the local road improvement grants. This is clarifying the Columbus interchange in um, Anoka County, uh, what can be included in the project. Uh, this is also from 2017. Section 18 on page 53 of the bill. Um, the rail service improvement uh, program. In 2017, there was uh, $1 million appropriated for rail service improvement grants. In the transportation finance bill this year, um, and in the bill summary, I give the uh, citation to the bill number engrossment and where you can find this. It creates a new freight rail economic development grant program, FRED, and um, this is not yet enacted, so the change to the 2017 rider for the Rail Service Improvement Program only takes effect if the FRED, program, FRED grant program is actually enacted, and then it makes the change effective at the same time. The page 54 of the bill, uh, section 19, is the Grand Rapids Pedestrian Bridge Project from 2017, and it adds construction, um, which I believe was the intent at, um, originally was to include construction as well as design with that money. On page 54 of the bill, again, Eden Prairie Rail Grade Crossings, uh, there was, this is the 2017 appropriation, and one of the uh, crossings is actually with a pathway, and that clarifies that this money can be used for a uh, crossing for a pathway as well as roads. On page 55 of Article 2, the White Bear Lake Multi-Use Trails, this corrects uh, the dollar amounts between the gr various grants to cities and uh, cor make some corrections in the roads uh, that are in the alignments. Uh, let's see, page 56, the Minneapolis uh, grant to the, for the family partnership. This is uh, take re deleting the uh, requirement for non-state contribution. The dollar amount was intended to cover uh, the total cost of the pre-design and design and then allows any money that's remaining to go to the next uh, phase of the project. On um, then the bottom of page 56 is the Minnesota Correctional Facility in St. Cloud. This corrects the uh, project description for the St. Cloud prison uh, project from last year. And then on page uh, 57 of the bill, the uh, St. Paul Minnesota Museum of American Art adds um, acquisition to the uh, uses of the money, and this corresponds to uh, the authorized uses of the appropriation for this project this year. And then on page 58 of the bill, uh, the Denison sewage treatment improvements, uh, there was a request from the engineers involved in this to clarify uh, the uses of the money for that project. There is also the uh, Fort Snelling uh, project that allows use of any unspent money from 2017 to go to the project this year. Um, and this year's bill for the actual construction of the new visitor center at Fort Snelling. And then there is the uncoded uh, provision for the behavioral crisis, health crisis facilities grants uh, that's appropriated money in Article 1. This is the program that would implement those grants. And then, as Mr. Lee mentioned um, on the last uh, page on page 60 of the bill, there is the uh, appropriation from the general fund for um, in the uh, tails for the, I think it's a, a, a grant to the Commissioner of Administration for a permit uh, review. And that concludes Article 2, Mr. Chair. All right. Thank you. If you want to hear me. All right, um, what we will be doing is uh, going into uh, public testimony next, and then uh, after that, uh, we'll have uh, let's see, amendments and discuss the bill. Uh, I would. Uh,
just give, I'm going to just give a quick little overview here before the public testimony uh, of my own. And that is we have an $825 million target, $25 million of which uh, is for the school security. And so essentially after that we have $800 million. Now in this bill, 67% uh, deals with asset preservation, about 38% of the bill with that. Um, and then uh, conservation water, about 16%. Uh, and uh, transportation, about 13%. So the goal in this was to be very heavy on infrastructure, bricks and mortar, asset preservation. You know, we own, we own 6,200 buildings, we should take care of them. Um, in PFA, which I assume we'll be testifying later, uh, we have uh, about, a, as you have heard, $120 million, which is the most that's ever been put into this category. I think it's important to uh, deal with the uh, crumbling infrastructure that we have uh, to the extent possible. Um, we have a bill that I think is geographically balanced and uh, trying to also uh, uh, put together a bill uh, that is bipartisan in terms of where the projects are. And I think uh, we have accomplished those goals. We have $8.5 million in cash. As Mr. Lee pointed out where those projects are earlier, the bulk of it, uh, $6.9 million <clears throat> uh, going to Duluth. And so uh, I think those are the highlights. I think we have uh, done, uh, and I want to thank the committee for the job that you did in helping uh, to put this together. Uh, it's a, a good bill in many respects. And so with that, uh, we'll begin the public testimony. And uh, I'm very, in uh, very interested in hearing uh, the many different ways that you can say thank you. <laughs> and uh, also uh, how you can say in various ways, we need more money. Uh, you have uh, a couple of minutes. We have a lot of testifiers, and so you have two minutes. And uh, we do have a, uh, a system of uh, alerting you as to uh, one minute and 30 seconds uh, so you can wind yourself down. So uh, with that, we will begin with the Commissioner Myron Franz. Mr. Chair, if it would be all right, I'd like to ask Mr. Mo Commissioner Mossman to join me to get this thing. But we need to add at least three, you know, the three minutes together here, Mr. Chair. Well, I don't know if I can take that much power in one place at the same time. <laughs> Is that right? If that's okay, Mr. All right. Chair. Thank uh, you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and thank you, committee, for letting us testify today. And I do want to say thank you, uh, as you suggested, to start off. But thank you, really, to the chair of the committee and the staff in particular for working with all the stakeholders, but particularly MMB, on getting a lot of these technical corrections uh, made in the bill. Very critical part of the bill. Thank you for that work. Um, you know, yesterday, uh, Mr. Chair, the governor was asked about this bill. You may have heard he asked, well, where's the other half? Uh, so I'm here today to say that's really a good question, Mr. Chair. I look forward to seeing the other half of this bill. What I really want to say is please don't stop here. The work of the committee is not done. Uh, you know, Mr. Uh, Commissioner Mossman, I want to remind the committee of the important work. The priorities that you laid out are good priorities. The, part of the problem is simply that we don't have the bonding bill at the size that we need. You know, one of the things that we have to now say, and you're going to have to listen to the committee and Mr. Chair today, are people talking about what's not in the bill and what needs to be done. I don't think any of us uh, disagree that we have over a $3.3 billion list of problems to, to deal with, and we deal with a very small portion of that in, in this bill. I know that many people say we cannot afford a $1.5 billion bonding bill, but Mr. Chair, as the state's chief financial officer, I say we can and we must do so. To be fiscally responsible, we must fix this critical infrastructure now, not later. You cannot afford to kick the can down the road anymore. So I ask again, Mr. Chair, where is the other half of this bill? Right. 
So, <laughs> so you ask, where's the other half of the bill, and then we'll end the envelope. <laughs> All being taken well, Welcome, Mr. Leon. Mr. Chair, I knew people weren't clapping for what I was saying, so I, I knew something was, I was going on. I was getting, I was looking down, and I was quite concerned when you said, we need more money, we need to have the bill, and Gunther starts to clap. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but he wasn't looking at me, Mr. Chair, so I knew something was up. Well, welcome back, uh, Representative Lilly. You have any comments, Representative Lilly, you care to make about cutting trees or anything? <laughs> That's good. Um, just really, thank you, everyone. Uh, I'm uh, I'm pretty messed up. <laughs> I know that's not a big surprise. I uh, um, I have over 20 different broken bones, and uh, I'm not going to walk and around and hug anybody. But a uh, um, little bit of medication, but just really blessed by all of you, um, by you know just both sides of the aisle. Uh, Dan Fabian actually. Uh, came to visit this morning and he actually we had to, uh, he wheeled me in but they had an uber and we uh, but anyways just everybody's been great so I'm sorry to interrupt so much but I I've really enjoyed serving on this committee and uh, um, I know it's basically done but anyways it's uh, <laughs> I, I, just, I just want to make sure you don't give it all to Ray and, uh, but no thank you thank you everyone well thank you great to have you here Mr. Chair, I don't, I don't know what to say after that. Uh, <laughs> uh, if, we, if medicine can put um, Representative Lilly back together, certainly we can get enough money to put Minnesota back together. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Let me try to get my uh, act back together here. Um, you know, the state borrows money through low interest loans that we are able to achieve through our good credit rating, and we're able to, use, to leverage our revenue to, in order to invest in capital projects around the state. So one of the things that we believe that the $1.5 billion bonding bill that the governor recommended falls within the $3.5 billion debt capacity that we have. But I want to take one opportunity to brag a little bit about MMB and what we've done to manage the debt. Uh, similar to refinancing a home, the state actively monitors interest rates and identifies opportunities for savings. We refinance state debt by taking advantage of low interest rates and in the process we save the taxpayer millions of dollars. Yeah. I'm happy to inform you that since 2011 we have saved over 300 million dollars for the state of Minnesota in interest payments through refinancing. That 300 million dollars of savings translates into annual general fund savings of between 10 and 20 million dollars over the next 10 years. Governor Dayton's team at MMB tries to manage very carefully the debt, and we think we've done so in a way that provides an opportunity for this state to invest in more, uh, in more bonding. I think the, uh, the other thing that Governor's uh, bonding bill represents, sound fiscal <coughs> management to make sure that we take care of the assets that we have. And let's not forget about the jobs that are created with a $1.5 billion bonding bill, and obviously a lot less, if, a half or so, for the current bonding bill. So I urge the, uh, the, governor, uh, the governor's bill to, uh, to be adopted, and, and I urge this committee to keep working, and I'll do whatever I can to help convince you to add more to this bonding bill. And I'll turn it over to Commissioner Mossman, unless there are any questions. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner. Uh, Mr. Chair and committee members, Matt Mossman, Commissioner of the State Department of Administration, thank you for the opportunity to testify, and welcome back, uh, Representative Lilly. Uh, <clears throat> first, I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for fully funding the department's $5 million CAPRA request. Uh, that's the only enterprise-wide asset preservation fund that is available to all state agencies. <clears throat> we track at the Department of Administration the condition of all state assets. And we know that as we sit here today that we have an enterprise-wide deferred maintenance backlog that is already $850 million, with over $500 million of asset preservation needed just to fix the worst rated building conditions. In addition, there's $1.96 billion that is needed to renew or replace building systems that are at the end of their useful life, bringing total asset preservation needs for agencies to $2.8 billion over 10 years. So, Mr. Chairman and members, I emphasize the scope of the problem because, uh, as today's bill does provide a positive starting point uh, for a long overdue uh, need to take care of buildings that we already own, at this level of investment, we will continue to be stuck in a cycle of inefficiency. 
Sufficient asset preservation uh, is needed to return state assets to acceptable condition and then to continue regular uh, preventative maintenance. The, the reality is that the fact that we're struggling to simply keep up with fixing things when they break is a sign of just how bad the problem is. The fiscally responsible standard is to maintain infrastructure to prevent it from breaking in the first place. So the other thing is, is the added cost. It costs 12 times more uh, to repair a building in critical condition than to properly maintain it in the first place. That means that the longer we wait, the longer uh, the backlog continues and the more the cost uh, of repairs are. When I visited the Hastings Veterans Home last week with Commissioner Shellito, we walked under leaking pipes and through wet rooms with peeling paints and crumbling floors. After a long winter, the HVAC system at the Silver Bay Veterans Home is on its final legs. In St. Peter, Deputy Commissioner Johnson and I toured an institutional kitchen that reaches temperatures well in excess of 100 degrees during the summer with condensation dripping down the walls due to an inadequate HVAC system. In just the past few years, we've experienced ductwork falling from ceilings into place spaces where people work, fire starting in electrical boxes, fire marshal orders to correct code violations in residential facilities, water pipe breaks causing millions of damage. Unfortunately, the millions spent to clean up after water pipe bursts uh, is uh, money that is not spent to improve the building, but simply to repair uh, damage caused by failures that should have been avoided uh, through regular maintenance. The funding to care for deteriorating state buildings is not an agency operating budget. It must come from a bonding bill. And the size of the bill must align with the size of the need if we are going to dig our way out of this problem. And the reality is that we just must. The state owns these buildings and we need to take care of them. So Mr. Chairman and members, uh, to sum it up, uh, these are not just office buildings um, with cube farms. These are local projects all over the state. As some of you have heard me say, uh, there are libraries and laboratories, parks and public health facilities, historic sites and hiking trails, <laughs> campsites and correctional facilities. From the armory to the zoo, these are buildings and facilities that add to Minnesota's quality of life and they're located in 86 of Minnesota's 87 counties. So Mr. Chairman and members, uh, the 97 million that is identified in the state agency bill specifically for general asset preservation addresses only about 11% of, of the deferred maintenance backlog um, that we are aware of. That leaves about 90% of the 6,200 buildings that you refer to and over 26,000 facilities uh, susceptible to further decline. So Mr. Chairman, members, just wrapping up, I again, I appreciate your willingness, Mr. Chairman, to engage in this important issue just as you led on the state capital preservation. So as you know firsthand how long and difficult it was to get that capital restoration project funded. Um, it is, of course, one of our state's most beloved and treasured landmarks. But while not every asset preservation project is as popular as that, uh, they all still serve the public, the greatly needed, and the needs are located all across the state of Minnesota. And I would just encourage you to, to work, uh, continue working on this bill to increase the amount available for asset preservation and renewal. And with that, happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, uh, Commissioner. Uh, Representative Hansen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, Commissioner Franz, looking through the bill um, on page 60, section 28, that, you know, and you've been serving as a financial officer for a while for the state. Have you seen anything like section 28 in the bonding bill before? I don't. I don't. Have it in front of me. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Representative, you know I had seen this earlier. No, I have. I have not. This is a new uh, provision to me. It's a fine piece of legislation. Just. Uh, okay. Thank you uh, very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, now we have the uh, Department of Corrections, and let me just say, uh, generally, that uh, because. Some of you re who are requesting don't uh, have the amount <clears throat> that you expected or wanted. Uh, it is there, there is, or you're not in there at all. Uh, it is not because the chair or the committee has a particular bias. It's just we have $800 million. Commissioner. Mr. Chair, committee members, good morning. Tom Roy, Commissioner of Corrections. 
I'm here to briefly talk about the contrast of your bill with the governor's proposals. Uh, asset preservation, I'm glad, is on the top of both lists. Uh, the governor's proposal for asset for Department of Corrections is $40 million. And Mr. Chair, I was especially pleased to hear you talk about the importance of fixing crumbling buildings. And I would add to that, it's especially important for those buildings that are over 100 years old. And the state of Minnesota relies on prisons that were constructed literally in the horse and buggy days. Uh, Stillwater, St. Cloud, Red Wing, and Moose Lake approaching 100 years. We have extended the life of those facilities as best we can. But we are way behind the curve in terms of asset preservation. And Commissioner Mossman talked about deferred maintenance. And the state's study shows that we have 13 buildings in crisis condition, 47 buildings in poor condition. And our total deferred maintenance currently calculated at $571 million. We also uh, do appreciate your inclusion of the St. Cloud perimeter fence and the Moose Lake control renovation. Those were on our wish list. The governor added two projects that we think are real important, and that is the renovation of Lionel Lakes building at 5.2 million and the Willow River expansion uh, of our challenge incarceration program. And those two renovations of existing facilities will give us a, about 105 more beds for population growth or special treatment of existing prisoners. On the governor's list also was the St. Cloud plumbing and ventilation upgrade. And, and these are, that's a particularly ugly project and I wish I could show you pictures of what 100-year-old clay sewer pipes look like, but uh, unfortunately, that wouldn't be a great way to start the day. Uh, we have significant needs in that aging facility. I've seen worse. <laughs> <laughs> worse thank you, to start thank you, today. Thank you, Representative Lillard. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> he's, he's under I'm the medication. He's on medication. <laughs> <laughs> How are the meds doing today? <laughs> so, Mr. Chair and committee members, I, I just will point out those topics to you, and I'll, I'll stand for questions. I know your time and your agenda is very uh, limited here, so thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Sorry. We will move on. Uh, next is uh, Keith Carlson of the Minnesota <coughs> County Association. On deck is uh, John Jaschke and Bowser. <laughs> so far we've been a little off, but I think you can do this in two minutes. Mr. Chairman, I'll try. I do want to start out by thanking the chair for the funding for the regional uh, mental health crisis centers, the uh, local government roads wetland replacement program, although we do have concerns as to whether that will be adequate to fund, or fund the entire two-year funding cycle, the transportation economic development grants and the local road uh, improvement program. Uh, however, we are concerned with the lack of funding for local bridges. I think the uh, committee or some members are under the misimpression that that bridge needs will be funded by last year's transportation funding bill. That's simply not true. There's only 12.9 uh, million available uh, for funding local bridge needs that approaches $373 million in total, 176 million in bond funding needs for uh, just 2018 alone. <laughs> Uh, unlike the local road improvement program, which is a competitive grant program that takes need uh, extensive time to solicit the grants, to process them and award them, 
the local bridge rehabilitation and replacement program puts monies in all your local economies right now. Um, I've passed out the list of those projects that are ready to go uh, as of uh, last November. Uh, and we've been told uh, by the department that now that list includes over 140 projects uh, with $64 million of uh, bonding need. Uh, this is probably one of the best ways to widely disperse uh, money from uh, the efforts that you're making with this bill and injects money immediately into your local economy. If you do it through the local road improvement program, you're going to be waiting over a year. With that, I'll conclude. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Carlson. Just let me point out that there is money in the transportation bill for uh, local bridges. Um, we are. Uh, we were informed that uh, we are to do the larger bridges in this committee and that local sm the, the smaller bridges are to be done through the transportation committee so that's why we don't have a larger amount for, for bridges because we only had basically one larger bridge that we we're going to do thank so you thank you mr. Carlson Ms. Jeschke, Executive Director, Board of Water and Soil Resources. Uh, we have Lynn Habheger of the Duluth Zoo on deck. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members. Angie Becker Kadelka, assistant. John, you don't look the same. Right? <laughs> He's changed. <laughs> um, assistant Director with the Board of Water and Soil Resources. I'm here today on behalf of Director Jasky, who's unable to make it. I uh, would like to thank the committee for the opportunity to testify and specifically talk about two provisions in the bill that were included. As Mr. Carlson said, the Local Roads Wetland Replacement Program is a state mandate that requires the state of Minnesota on, uh, uh, through Bowser to replace wetlands due to local road projects that impact wetlands. The program is cost efficient, it expedites permitting, and it provides higher quality wetlands and is, uh, and is appreciated both state and locally for its cost savings. The $5 million continues the program at its one year worth of funding. However, the program is running a deficit right now and at current levels is unsustainable. The Minnesota CREP Conservation Reserve Enhancement Program, the committee has recommended funding at $10 million. The Conservation Reserve Enhancement Program, uh, as you all know, is a large federal state program that provides uh, up to 350 million federal dollars directly out to landowners in Minnesota who voluntarily choose to protect vulnerable drinking water through wellhead protections, to enhance grassland and wetland habitats, and to provide water quality improvements. Signups for the program began in May of 2017. We have already over $55 million in applications that have been submitted to date. This moves us 10 million closer to our goal. The governor's office did put in a $30 million request so that bonding would be a larger part of this project. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Havhegger is up next. And following uh, Lisa Wilcox Earhart of Common Bond. Welcome. Begin, please. Good morning, Mr. Chair, committee members. Thank you for allowing me to address the committee this morning. My name is Lynn Habiger. I'm with the Lake Superior Zoo, and I'm here on behalf of the Lake Superior Zoological Society, the nonprofit that operates the Lake Superior Zoo on behalf of the city of Duluth. As you are all well aware, six years ago next month, Duluth and the surrounding area experienced what has been referred to as a 100-year flood. As a result of that flood, the zoo's most popular exhibit that was home to our polar bear and seals was destroyed beyond re reasonable repair. While I don't want to dwell on the flood, it does define where we are today. In the days, weeks, and months following the flood, the society and the community took on the daunting task of restoring the zoo. Animals displaced by the flood were relocated to other zoos. The grounds and the buildings were cleared of debris and cleaned, and the zoo reopened to public less than a month later. In close collaboration with the city of Duluth, MnDOT, and the Minnesota DNR, several projects were undertaken to prevent the likelihood that such damage could ever happen again. 
The only piece of the zoo's restoration that remains is the Polar Shores Complex, located in the center of our zoo. For six years, this exhibit, the focal point of our zoo, has remained empty and blighted due to the amount of financial assistance required to restore it. Of all of the entities in Duluth to suffer flood damage, the Lake Superior Zoo is the only one who has not yet been made whole by any disaster relief funds or assistance. The society has done its due diligence and all it can without support from our partners from state and local government. We have brought forward what we considered to be a modest request for $1.9 million to restore and preserve this historic and beloved asset. We have secured $1.9 million in matching funds from the City of Duluth and we have embarked on a capital campaign to raise an additional $500,000 in private donations. The proposed project is a brown bear habitat with an adjoining large cat exhibit that will relocate our snow leopard and lynx as part of the new master plan with the city of Duluth. This project is the first phase of a larger plan to continue to improve our zoo and to ensure its future as a vibrant and sustainable community and educational asset. The Lake, in closing, the Lake Superior Zoo is accredited by the Association of Zoos and Aquariums our service area includes not only the residents of the Arrowhead region, but the Iron Range, northwestern Wisconsin, those traveling from south and metro Minnesota, the Dakotas, and Canada. Our zoo is steeped in Minnesota history and tradition and will be celebrating its centennial in five years. We respectfully request your earnest consideration of our request. Thank you for your valuable time, and I'll be happy to answer any questions if you have them. Uh, thank you. And we'll see you later. <laughs> yes, you will. <laughs> and you're welcome to visit us again. Uh, now we have uh, Lisa Wilcox Earhart, Common Bond. Yep. And uh, this is Justin Hardwick. He's Justin. a resident I've invited to, to come All over right. with us. Again, please. Great. Thank you, um, Chair Erdahl and members of the committee. My name is Lisa Wilcox Earhart, and I'm the Executive Vice President of Housing and Services at Common Bond Communities. And I'm here today as a representative of the Homes for All Coalition to thank you for including, for funding affordable housing in the, the House Bonding Bill. Common Bond owns and manages 5,747 units of high quality, affordable rental apartments and townhomes in Minnesota that are home to more than 9,500 individuals. But Common Bond is more than just apartments. We care about providing opportunities and support for residents. In many instances, Common Bond residents take active leadership roles in their communities, and youth in our teen programs achieve a 100% graduation rate. Seniors and veterans receive the support they need to live independently and stably through Common Bond. I truly believe that none of these things would be possible without safe, stable, and affordable housing. Using housing infrastructure bonds, Common Bond has been able to develop and preserve four projects equaling 663 units and helping 1,147 people. With additional funding, we certainly can do more. Housing infrastructure bonds means nearly 100 individuals and families were able to find permanent affordable housing and access job training and supportive services at Common Bond's Upper, Upper Post Veterans Community. Upper Post Veterans Community and 47 other projects across the state would not be possible with housing infrastructure bonds. HIB bonds are one of the few financial tools available for affordable housing. Thank you for including 50 million for HIB and 6.7 million for general obligation bonds. I encourage the committee to increase their numbers. Half of all Minnesotans who pay rent are cost burdened and paying more than 30% of their income on housing. The number of families and children experiencing homelessness is increasing. By preserving existing assets and providing supportive housing, we can provide safe, stable, and affordable housing to hundreds more families. The benefits of this investment are numerous, including better performing students, a more productive work workforce, and cost-saving emergency services. And ask Justin to say a word. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. And just a couple more words. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Justin Howard. I'm a resident of Common Bond Upper Post Community. I'd like to tell you a little bit about my background. 
and why I appreciate having a home at Common Bond Communities. I grew up in upstate New York. My mom worked as a nurse and took good care of my three siblings. After high school, I signed up for the delayed entry program in the military and went on to have a decent career in the Army. When I came to, from the military during the tough economic times, I had hard times adjusting back to society, ended up with some substance abuse problems. <coughs> in short, that led to bad decisions. Bad decisions led to homelessness. Homelessness is why my life in 2014. Sometimes I spent it outside. Other times I slept on a couch. I could be at my brother's place sometimes, but it was hard not to overstay my welcome. As a military person, I needed to have some get up and go of my own. I needed some structure. Then I heard about Common Bond, renovating the old Fort Snelling building. And in November 2014, 2014, I moved into the upper post. It gives me a base, lets me have structure. My world is to get back on my feet. I have a key to my own home. I can use upper post uh, as a platform to do so many other things. Upper post is about self-sufficiency. It gives vets a place to call home and a space to heal. When you've been homeless for so many years, living under bridges and under trees, it's pretty amazing things that someone hands you your own utilities and you can make your own coffee and scrambled eggs on of your own. These things speak so strongly to getting people back to self-sufficiency. From homelessness to, to shelters is a beautiful thing. I've been in common buying homes for three years. I was the first coordinator of the food shelf at Upper Post. During those three years, I also became a minister, found a steady church home in the community. I'm a youth coach. I love volunteering to do good things with kids in sports. Like I said, Common Bond has a, afforded me a platform to be able to give back. And here's my final thought. I'm comfortable. I'm real comfortable now that I have a home. But what about the guy not far behind me, the guy who was walking in the lines between going on and back out on the streets or doing something with his life. There's a lot going on for people. Of, and of course, we don't know their stories. But when we finally say, I'm tired and I need a place to lay my head, a place like Upper Post is there for them. There's a vet out there, there that's not comfortable and he needs a place to call home. I'm okay now. So I want to help others. Common Bond has given me the platform to do so and it is my job because it's the right, upright thing to do. Thank you very much. Thank you, appreciate your comments, mm -hmm. Mr. Harvey. And uh, now we have uh, Jeff Oliver, the Golden Valley City Engineer with Commissioner Tangerthal on deck. And uh, let me just say that we're not doing a real great job in this two minutes thing. <laughs> uh, and, um, Two minutes means two minutes for both of you, not two minutes each. Otherwise, I could have five people up there from one group, and suddenly I'm at, you know, ten. Oh well, no! That, I, w I was. <laughs> Thank you guys. I, I was mentally trying to figure out how many minutes you would actually talk, and it wouldn't have been ten. So let's continue, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, I'm Jeff Oliver. I'm the city engineer for the city of Golden Valley. I have with me uh, Lori Larson, who is a, a resident of New Hope uh, that took some of the photographs that you all received yesterday via email. I'm here today representing not only Golden Valley, but the cities of Crystal and New Hope in support of full funding for the DNR flood damage reduction grant request. That request includes an important project for the three cities uh, that all contribute stormwater runoff to a flood prone area known as the Decola Ponds and Medicine Lake Road area. We have enough. The recent, uh, flood uh, a recent flood damage reduction study performed by the cities identified 39 properties that were prone to repeat flood damage. With flood depths up to five feet on Medicine Lake Road, which is a high volume county road that it serves as the border between the three cities. The study also laid out a long range uh, plan that included six projects to provide flood storage that would significantly reduce flood levels and protect these homes and businesses. The cities are currently partnering with the Bassett Creek Watershed Management Commission to prepare a feasibility report and I have a draft copy uh, with, with me today. Um, 
that in, that include that is includes the projects that are included in the DNR request. When the six projects are completed, the flood levels, or when this project is completed, the flood levels on Medicine Lake Road will be lowered significantly enough to allow safe passage of emergency vehicles during flood conditions. In addition, six properties will no longer be at risk of flooding during the 100 year flood. And the, uh, and it will be, the risk of flooding will be significantly reduced for additional homes. By full, providing full funding of the DNR reduction program, you will allow the cities of Crystal, Golden Valley, and New Hope to begin final design of the first project and begin construction late in 2019. Thank you for your time, and I'd be happy to answer questions you may have. How'd I do for time? Ms. Larson, you got about 15 seconds. You could introduce yourself. 15 seconds. I will just say thank you for the consideration. I have lived at this property for 12 years, and repeatedly it has flooded to the levels that you saw in the photos that were sent to you. And the idea of having dry property for the first time in 12 years is very exciting, and this funding could make it possible. So thank you. Well, thank you. I'm just wondering if there's any way we could combine uh, Representative Carlson's pool request with the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Uh, Commissioner Tengerthal and Arlene Chermoff uh, uh, from the Met Council will be next. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, my name is Mary Tengerthal. I'm Commissioner at the Minnesota Housing Finance Agency. And I want to thank you today for including housing in the bonding bill. This bill includes just under $50 million in housing infrastructure bonds and $6.7 million for urgently needed repairs for public housing. However, as you've heard from some of my colleagues, we are concerned that the amount of the funding in the bill is not sufficient uh, to meet the statewide needs for investment in our housing infrastructure. Governor Dayton proposed $115 million in housing in his bonding proposal, and um, we hope that as we go through the discussions that um, the bill and the number can be larger. Since 2012, uh, with the support from the legislature on a bipartisan basis, bonding dollars for housing have uh, produced over 7,500 homes in 124 housing developments across the state. We have provided you with a handout, uh, and that on page three has a map of all of the communities where uh, these housing investments have been made since 2012. However, each time that we've received housing infrastructure bonds, we can only fund about one out of every three applications that comes in uh, to the agency on a competitive basis. The bill also adds two new eligible uses for housing infrastructure bonds, and uh, we want to say that we support uh, the inclusion of uh, the senior housing language. We do have some concerns about including the manufactured home park infrastructure language because we think this is not the most appropriate funding source for that need, but we're willing to uh, work with the authors to uh, talk further about that. Um, we remain concerned about the lower level of funding for these will um, uh, make it difficult to meet all of the needs. Again, uh, we hope that we will be able to work with you uh, to see a larger number as we move forward. Thank you. Uh, yeah. right back. Just thank you, Mr. Chair. A quick question. So wh what percent of the hundred million would be for supportive housing? Uh, would you say, do you have, is there such a number? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Representative, um, we do not have a prescribed number uh, in the housing infrastructure bonds. There are now four eligible, uh, there would be four eligible activities, five if, if all of them were included. Supportive housing is one, preservation, uh, land for community, land trust for single family, and then if you added two more, senior and manufactured housing. We have a competitive application and uh, we don't determine how much will be set aside for each. Thank you. Representative Hausman, do you have a question? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. When you uh, briefed Ways and Means, I think you had um, a long list of workforce housing that was also all over the state. And then I think uh, we made some observation about the number of projects you've done. We heard about the, the one at the upper post uh, just previously, but that you have a variety of um, veterans housing uh, projects too. 
Commissioner. Mr. Chair, Representative Houseman, yes, that's correct. We have uh, <laughs> supportive housing developments all over the state as well as preserved properties. We have uh, an, another uh, project near um, the VA hospital uh, for veterans that just opened last year. There's one also adjacent to the St. Cloud Hospital. And we have, uh, we just learned yesterday when I was in Crookston uh, that there is a project that just opened its doors in Moorhead. Uh, also a project opened uh, last year in Bemidji, Rochester, uh, Grand Rapids, Duluth, uh, et cetera. So um, supportive housing is not something that's just needed in the Twin Cities. We've worked very successfully with communities around the state uh, to address issues of homelessness, including veterans homelessness. Okay, thank you. And now we have uh, Arlene uh, Chermoff uh, from the Met Council, uh, Chuck Johnson, Commissioner of VHS is next. Uh, let me just quickly say that um, I understand uh, the Commissioner uh, Tingerthal saying that it, it's difficult to fulfill a number of requests. Uh, well, it's, that's our difficulty here. Uh, I, we could fulfill one in five. It's like, you know, you throw out one cherry and four lumps of coal. Begin, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the Capital Investment Committee. My name is Aline Shoromoff, and I am the chair of the Metropolitan Council. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you this morning. As you are aware, the governor recommended $105 million in bonds for the Metropolitan Council to make investments in our arterial bus rapid transit system and construct a new bus maintenance and storage facility. He also recommended $5 million for inflow infiltration grants to help local governments address address this problem so we aren't treating clean water and unnecessary capacity and adding unnecessary capacity in our wastewater system. I do appreciate the committee including funding for inflow infiltration grants at the governor's recommended amount, but I was disappointed to see the lack of investment for transit. In fact, there's nothing for transit in this bill. Based on our conversations with legislators and in hearings, um, and that included in the House Transportation Finance Committee, we believe that our planned investment in arterial bus rapid transit enjoys bipartisan support. ABRT is high frequency limited stop service offering an improved customer experience on arterial streets in an urban environment. ABRT provides improved speed, frequency, passenger experience, and reliability by upgrading vehicle and station quality without higher capital costs, construction impacts, and right-of-way right -of requirements or a dedicated corridor. These improvements lead to lower operating costs and improve ridership of our system overall. Lower costs allow for faster implementation of transit improvements. If you've seen the A line, which is our first arterial BRT line in our system, it has seen a 32% increase in ridership just a year after opening. So our plan is to add additional lines to the system and we're reliant on the state to move those projects forward. So I would just encourage you, I appreciate the, the, the support for inflow and infiltration and as you can continue this process um, to consider including transit. You could mention the parks too. I appreciate the support for that as okay. well. Thank you. Thank you. And now uh, we have uh, Chuck Johnson, the Commissioner of DHS and Ann Finn from the League of Minnesota Cities next. Welcome Commissioner. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Chuck Johnson. I serve as Acting Commissioner at the Department of Human Services. Uh, and thanks for the work of the committee on this bill. I uh, appreciate the inclusion of our third bonding priority, $6.75 million for the Anoka Hospital. Uh, that uh, will help us a lot in terms of the roof uh, and HVAC repairs we need to make there. Anoka is a psychiatric hospital, provides uh, the care to some of the uh, most uh, needy patients in Minnesota, and we need to keep that facility working properly. We're also pleased with the committee's attention to asset preservation. Uh, DHS has 152 facilities across the state, two and a half million square feet. These facilities provide critical care and treatment to vulnerable Minnesotans and also treatment to those individuals who are civilly committed to us often because they can't be treated safely in the community. However, the bill only funds $10 million of the $18.6 million request we made for asset preservation. Uh, we're concerned like a lot of agencies and as Commissioner Mossman said, we continue to struggle to keep up with those needs. We have $60 million in deferred maintenance across our facilities. And over the last seven years, we've averaged about a million and a half dollars a year we spend out of our operating budget to do building repairs that we don't have asset preservation dollars to appropriately take care of. 
We're also particularly disappointed the bill did not include DHS's top priority, uh, and that relates to uh, phase two work for the sex offender program on the St. Peter campus. This is a $16.2 million request. This is to build more capacity at a part of the sex offender program is called community preparation services. This is the last part of treatment within the program. It's also a part of treatment that courts order people to go into. We don't control how many people go into this part of the treatment uh, program. Uh, in 2014, we had 22 men in this part of the program. Now we have uh, 119, 89 of whom we have beds for and 30 of whom are on waiting lists. Uh, these are older buildings. What we propose is to remodel some older buildings to create 50 additional beds uh, for these individuals as well as programming space. And this is the top priority for DHS for this session. We also uh, would like to have the dietary building in St. Peter. Mr. Uh, Commissioner Mossman referenced this. Uh, this building has no air conditioning uh, and needs an up, uh, HVAC upgrade. Uh, finally, Mr. Chair, I'd like to just mention the re regional behavioral health crisis centers that are in the bill. Um, in the bill, this would have DHS essentially oversee the grant mechanism that would provide funding <laughs> to regions who want to create one of these crisis centers. The set of criteria that we would have uh, each of those entities meet in order to create the center. Uh, included in that is sustainability, ensuring that we're not building a building with millions of dollars if there isn't a sustainable program with revenue sources that will support that program going forward. Uh, we appreciate being part of that process. We think it's important we ensure that these uh, programs are going to fill a needed gap in the community, are going to be sustainable going forward. We did put a fiscal note on that of two FTEs to manage that process. That fiscal note is not funded. We appreciate the inclusion of the two FTEs. We think it's important to ensure that that project is successful going forward. Thanks for the opportunity to share our concerns uh, today. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. And uh, next we have Ann Finn, a League of Minnesota Cities, and then uh, Kent Lacazmole from the DNR will be next. <coughs> well, Good morning, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Ann Finn, and I represent the League of Minnesota Cities. I'll make three points today. Uh, the first is that we do appreciate the inclusion of funding for water infrastructure um, programs, and uh, we recognize that that's a substantial amount. Um, my colleague Craig Johnson would be before you today and tell you that he'd like to see that a little closer to the governor's number of 167 million. Um, secondly, we are very appreciative of the uh, local road improvement program <coughs> funds that are included in this bill. That program has been wildly successful um, with our cities and it has funded uh, multiple very important projects that are pretty much on a very small scale, but go a long way in our smaller communities. And finally, um, in terms of the local road improvement program, one provision that we've been trying to secure for a number of years is um, to allow some of the funds within that program to be used for local cost participation and trunk highway projects. And that's something that was included in uh, Representative Howe's bill that was passed by the Transportation Committee and sent in this direction. Um, so I'd like to hopefully work with the author on getting uh, that provision included in the future as this moves forward. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Finn. Uh, next, we have Kent Lagasmo, and up next after him, uh, Commissioner uh, Jan Malcolm from the Department of Health. Uh, Welcome, thank Mr. you, Lockesmo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Kent Lockesmo, Director of Capital Investment for DNR. And Commissioner Landwehr couldn't be here today. Uh, and certainly I want to thank you for the funding that you provided for our natural resources, asset preservation, betterment of buildings, flood hazard mitigation projects, and the accessibility for state parks. But the, just to reiterate on the needs for asset preservation, DNR's asset preservation is, is broader than just buildings. It's for all types of assets. In our 10-year needs report, we identified $370 million of unmet needs or of deferred maintenance. $120 million of that was in buildings. And like uh, Commissioner Mosman said, there's 6,200 buildings in the state. DNR has about a little less than half of those, 2,700. 192 are in crisis condition, 520 are in poor condition. <coughs> the building components in these, in these uh, buildings, like the roofs, the walls, the windows, we have 29,000 building components. There's $4 million of unacceptable components and $30 million of poor components. So the $30 million that you provided in this bill is a good start. And I would urge the committee as you go forward, certainly if the bill grows, we could use more money here. And in future years, we need to have a sustained level of funding. I think that was talked about in committee earlier. And uh, that would really allow us to address these issues on an ongoing basis. Thank you. Thank you. 
And now we have uh, Commissioner Malcolm and and we have Alice with a question first. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I was just going to ask him if he if he gave his top priority of something that wasn't in the bill. What would one what would the top one be? I don't know if you if he could answer that right now or. Ms. Lucasmo, you want to tell us what number one is? What's number one? <laughs> and uh, can you re repeat the question? Uh, you mentioned a variety of areas, but if you if you identified the number one, what's the what's the most crucial? Our our uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, Representative Hosman. That's not in the bill. Oh, that is not in the bill. Right. The um, well, there was funding for everything in the other. Like Greenleaf Lake. State Park is what we're going to say. <laughs> uh, Mr. Chairman, the, uh, there was funding for everything in the governor's recommend oh. recommendation except for dam safety. And in the dam safety program, we had initially requested two million. Governor's bill had a million. And we did get $9.4 million last year in dam safety, so we are working through that list. Uh, we do hold money back in that program for any emergencies. So um, I guess we receive funding in all the areas other than dam safety. Thank you. Commissioner Malcolm. Good morning, Chair Erdahl, members of the committee. Jan Malcolm, Commissioner of the Health Department. I'm here today to call your attention to one item that is not uh, yet in the committee's bonding bill. We appreciate the difficulty of your task. I'm Thank speaking you. for uh, Commissioner uh, Fredrickson as well this morning, who, can't, uh, who cannot be here. To call your attention to the uh, important need for uh, bonding to uh, shore up the building that we share in the departments of health and agriculture in our laboratory functions. So we're talking about the lab building in specific, which is just across the way here. I know some of you have had the chance to visit the lab. I hope others of you will be able to at some point. It is an absolutely remarkable um, asset for the state of Minnesota. The governor's bill included just under $20 million to correct important safety, energy, and operational efficiency issues at the shared laboratory building. Architectural, mechanical, and electrical improvements are needed to support critical lab testing in the areas of emergency response, food safety, infectious disease, homeland security, and environmental contaminants. Following a 2014 flooding event, which, which happened as a result of the polar vortex winter and the, the thawing of, uh, that happened after that time, uh, we had some really serious flooding in the, in the building, which led us to do a recommissioning study to look more deeply at what caused that and what other issues might be, uh, might be lurking um, and result in suboptimal building performance. Uh, looking at the mechanical systems and electrical systems in particular. We did identify in that study um, a number of, of needs, including um, exhaust work, improvements to the duct work, and air pressure control issues, which are really quite important and serious given the, the types of agents we deal with uh, in the laboratories. Uh, we really need to maintain our capacity to operate these labs at full capacity given their, their importance and their impact on, not only on human health and the environment, but the agricultural economy in Minnesota as well. So we really strongly believe that this uh, proposal fits the committee's priorities and the chairman's priorities and speaks very clearly to what Commissioner Mossman talked about, the, the, uh, the wisdom of uh, preventing and fixing problems when, they know, uh, when we know that they exist rather than waiting for the next catastrophic failure. I'd also like to draw your attention to uh, a, a general fund request that's included in the governor's bonding proposal that is for an additional uh, just over $2 million in one-time resources to replace outdated equipment in the public health laboratory. Again, I would just mention that this, this co-located laboratory between health and ag um, has uh, just added tremendous capacity uh, for our state that uh, I think is, a, is an excellent example of partnership and stewardship. Um, keeping these labs at their top of the nation capability I think is a wonderful um, investment for the state of Minnesota and returns uh, great benefits to human health, environment, and the agricultural economy. Thank you so much for your consideration as you move forward. Thank you. And now uh, we have uh, Steve Huser from the Minnesota Cities and next uh, Benjamin Johnson of the Minnesota Department of Veterans Affairs. Welcome, Mr. Hughes. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Stephen Huser and I represent Metro Cities. Metro Cities represents the shared interests of cities in the seven county metro area at the legislature, executive branch, and Metropolitan Council. Metro Cities would like to especially thank the committee for the inclusion of funding for inflow and infiltration mitigation. Metro Cities uh, also appreciates the inclusion of local road improvement fund grants in this bill. We look forward to working with the committee as the bill advances. Thank you. Oh, congratulations. That was very good. <laughs> You might get all your money and more. I don't know. Uh, now we have uh, Benjamin Johnson and uh, next uh, Commissioner uh, John Link Stein. Uh, Chair Erdahl, members of the committee, my name is Benjamin Johnson. I'm the legislative director for the Minnesota Department of Veterans Affairs. Uh, thank you for allowing me to comment on House File 4404. I'd like to start by saying thank you for including the Minnesota Department of Veterans Affairs in your capital improvements bill. Our agency is responsible for the operations, maintenance, and upkeep of five existing state veterans' homes and two veteran cemeteries located all over the state of Minnesota. We are tasked with making sure that our residents, veterans, and their spouses are not only well taken care of by our medical and support staff, but that the buildings they call home are safe, comfortable, and well maintained. We're responsible to the families of those heroes interred in our cemeteries to do our utmost in caring for their loved ones' final resting place. In addition to the residents and the families, we owe it to visitors, staff, and the people of Minnesota to do everything in our power to take care of these state assets. We're bound by statute and obligated by our position to address the repair and upkeep needs of these existing veterans' homes and cemeteries. As with any home, some of our maintenance requires more investment than the day-to-day -day operational funding is able to address. The $10 million in asset preservation funding that you've included will take care of some of our most critical issues. However, I need to note that we have requested and Governor Dayton has supported $13 million in funding to address our highest priority needs. This is only a fraction of the approximately $38 million in deferred maintenance that we are currently facing, but we prioritized our most urgent positions. $10 million will absolutely be put to good use but I wanted to note that this will leave some significant repairs unfunded. Once again, thank you for your consideration. Thank you very much, good job. Now we'll have uh, Commissioner John Link Stein from the PCA, and next is uh, Mike Berelson, uh, U of M Vice President for University Services. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, John Link Stein, Commissioner of the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency on behalf of all the uh, Residents of District 43B, I applaud uh, uh, my state legislator, Representative Leon Lilly, for his proof that he is one tough legislator. <laughs> I uh, want to uh, just comment quickly on several provisions of the bill this morning, Mr. Chair. Given my uh, family's legacy, I'll say words of appreciation and danke schön uh, for the inclusion of uh, the $6 million for the WD landfill in, in Andover, Minnesota, a site that has proven to be more complicated and polluting than it originally thought. Second, we are grateful for the inclusion of $120 million for the Public Facilities Authority in wastewater and water infrastructure across the state of Minnesota. It's shy of the governor's request of $167 million, but we, we definitely know that those $120 million are needed. I've personally been touring wastewater uh, and drinking water facilities around the state, and the need is obvious. By the way, it is the most ever issued before. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I also have a serious concern that the bill fails to include any funding for the cleanup of the freeway landfill located in the city of Burnsville, immediately adjacent to I-35W at the Minnesota River. That landfill is uh, a threat to uh, water resources, including the drinking water for Burnsville and Savage, as well as the Minnesota River. And we are started, we have started our work on the site, but uh, we are now finding that pollution concerns are far worse than we anticipated. And uh, this bill leaves us without the uh, resources to address that serious problem. Lastly, Mr. Chair, in section 28, page 60 of the bill, the funding for the Minnesota Environmental Science and Economic Review Board is objectionable to the agency because it, it relies on a faulty presumption that the permits for municipal wastewater facilities are not adequately reviewed or that there are not uh, opportunities for due process review of the permits by the communities. It sets up a, a, a situation in which 
Some permittees have special opportunity to review uh, their conditions with the agency, but not all. And we, we oppose that provision. With that, Mr. Chair, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And next we have uh, Mike Ber uh, Berelson and then Emily Murray for the counties. And, and let me, uh, Commissioner uh, Linkstein, just to briefly comment that uh, with the freeway landfill, you know, we certainly recognize that as an important issue. Uh, but there are a couple of problems. One, the cost uh, is big. But the other, uh, maybe even more important uh, in the minds of many, is the uh, what we consider to be an ownership question. And if when that gets solved, uh, we are more likely to act on the other stuff. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is Mike Bertelson. I'm the Vice President for University Services at the University of Minnesota. And uh, Representative Lilly, the President, uh, Kaler, asked me to tell you he's uh, put in a call to Goldie and they hope to come see you soon. <laughs> um, so, Mr. Chair, first again, as many others, thank you for your support of the University of Minnesota and the $78.5 million in the bill. Projects like um, the Greater Minnesota Academic Renewal and Pillsbury Hall have been on our list for many, many years. Um, and we're grateful for your support to move those forward. We're also appreciative of the $40 million in HEPR included in the legislation. We can put that money to work right away getting these resources in the hand of local Minnesota contractors across the state. As you know, the university requested $200 million for HEPR this year and re that remains our top re uh, priority in, in our capital request. And the $200 million was not randomly chosen. Across the state, the university should be spending $200 million investing $200 million annually just to maintain the current condition of our large set of facilities. Hence, we're in a declining condition toward more criti poor and critical space, which increases the risk of facility failure and clearly undermines our ability to continue to research, teach, and learn. Our 10-year $4.2 billion list of capital deferred capital renewal projects across the system only gets longer each year without continued support from the state. At the $40 million uh, target, however, many of our critical projects that you have seen on your tours and heard about will not be completed. This, the state support is very critical for us in that because HEPA projects are not projects that are easily or able to be fundraised for. We won't find donor who wants to put her name on an HVAC system or a roof. We count on the partnership of the state to renew these facilities and maintain their integrity. Mr. Chair, we are, commonly, we are keenly aware that you're under a, um, operating under a very strict budget target. And necessitates very difficult decisions for you and the committee. We are grateful to be included and we just respectfully ask that as you continue your work uh, that you look to find more resources for HEPA and the critical uh, capital renewal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next we have Emily Murray of the counties and then uh, Brian Yolitz of Minnesota State. Welcome. Mr. Chair and members, my name is Emily Murray with the Association of Minnesota Counties. On behalf of AMC and the Minnesota Association of County Social Services Administrators, we want to thank the chair and the committee for including funding for the behavioral health crisis facilities in this bill. This funding is an important step to build the infrastructure and facilities where individuals can receive the level of mental health services they need and strengthen our mental health system. This was one of AMC's top priorities this session, and all 87 county boards passed resolutions in support of this initiative. Another one of AMC's top priorities this year was funding for the local road improvement program and the local <coughs> bridge replacement program. We want to thank you for including $72 million in undesignated funding for the local road improvement program. This will go a long way <coughs> to fund local road projects across the state. Our final bonding priority this year was funding for the local road wetland replacement program. We want to stress the importance of funding this program as two of the 10 wetland bank service areas across the state are still at zero credits after under underfunding for the program in recent years. We appreciate the five million included in this bill for this program, which will help build up, build up credits, but does not eliminate the need for future funds in order for the program to get back up to full capacity. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And now, uh, Mr. Yolitz, and on deck, Steve Elliott. Good morning, Mr. Chair and Committee. Good morning. I, I am Brian Yolitz, and I serve as the Associate Vice Chancellor for Facilities for the Minnesota State Colleges and University System. Thank you for the opportunity to briefly address the proposed proposal before this committee. On behalf of the students, faculty, staff, the Board of Trustees of the Minnesota State System, and traveling Chancellor Maholtra, 
I thank you for your time and attention last fall in visiting so many of our campuses and seeing firsthand the urgent needs and priorities for capital investment in our campuses. You and the committee staff, particularly Gavin Hansen, ensured each visit was a timely and effective and highly professional. And the result is of this detailed work is evident in the funding offered in this bill to the colleges and universities of Minnesota State. We are thankful for the 123 million capital program this bill enables and how it recognizes and delivers on the priorities set forth by our board through our capital development process. We recognize this committee has, uh, has a great deal of work uh, request before them and of, there are many hopes that the, uh, makes us, make, we hope that our process makes your work a bit easier. This funding begins to address some of the growing asset preservation needs and funds the 10 next priorities enabling construction to happen at six campuses and designed to begin work for work at four others. The point of con specific concern is the level of asset preservation funding or HEPR and our ability to meet the stewardship responsibility associated with our 54 campuses and nearly one third of the state's uh, building infrastructure. We recognize there is more work ahead. We look forward to working with you and your colleagues in the Senate and the executive branch in the coming days to bring this to reality. Our focus will be on bolstering the asset preservation through HEPR and helping keep our campuses warm, safe, and dry. Again, Mr. Chair, thank you and Shukran for my prior life, uh, for your work on this bill and, and your time and attention this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you. And next we have uh, from the Minnesota State Historical Society, Steve Elliott and John Jensen, Military Affairs, will be next. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Good morning. I'm joined by one of my board members, um, General Rick Nash. Um, I'm Steve Elliott. I'm the director of the Minnesota Historical Society. And I want to start by saying thank you so much for this third appropriation to support uh, the important preservation work at Historic Fort Snelling, our state's first national historic landmark. And thank you for the $10 million in asset preservation, uh, which will go a long way to helping on our 26 historic properties, our 150 buildings, half of which are a century old and very demanding. Uh, we are just so grateful for, for this support. Um, and I just want to uh, invite you all to uh, visit the fort as, this summer as we begin to expand the interpretation. Uh, and uh, we have a couple of specific programs coming up, including an exhibit in the stone barracks that will feature veterans from seven different eras all the way up through Vietnam, uh, Kuwait, and Afghanistan. And uh, in the three different rooms, we'll highlight why they serve and um, what, it, what it was like to serve at Fort Snelling and what the relationship is between military service and citizenship. Um, as we work on those, the brick and mortar over the next couple of years, the program at Fort Snelling, which is dynamic, will continue to develop and will be ever evolving. And we look forward to continuing to talk with all of you about that. General? Thank Mr. You. Chairman, members of the committee, I'm Major General Retired Rick Nash, the former Adjutant General for the State of Minnesota. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would also like to reiterate your thanks, or thanks to each and every one of the members for the support of this project and also for the legislature's support for the design money in the past two years in order to keep this project moving and on schedule, which we believe will be in completion in 2020 <laughs> in time for the bicentennial of Fort Snelling. And we also look forward to also expanding at the new visitor center, the stories of our current military members, those in the past and those that will come in the future. And so this is of a great historic significance to be able to have a new visitor center at the Fort Snelling complex. So Mr. Chairman, thank you for the time. This is the fifth time I've testified. So my comments are already on record, both in the different house committees and in the Senate. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we have uh, Joe Jensen, Military Affairs, and then Eric Redeen of MnDOT. John Jensen, I said go. Good morning, Mr. Uh, Chair, uh, and, and once again, thank you for letting me follow Rick Nash. It seems like I've done that several times in my career. <laughs> Mr. Chair and members of this committee, I'm Major General John Jensen, the Adjutant General of the Minnesota National Guard. It's not Joe, it's John. <laughs> I uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and committee members for your support of the Minnesota National Guard by listing the St. Cloud Armory 
renovation in the upcoming bonding uh, proposal house file 4404. I understand that you and the committee face an extremely difficult challenge in determining the worthiness of the myriad of proposals submitted. I'm disappointed that the St. Cloud project was the only one of six agency proposals that made the cut and I'm concerned that this perpetuates a growing pattern of providing insufficient investment in the facilities of the National Guard. By federal law, the maintenance and upkeep of our armories is split 50-50 between the state and federal governments. Approval of these projects will result in a one-for-one -one match in federal funding. Without a state match, we cannot spend any federal funds on these facilities. In three of the five previous bonding bills, the Minnesota National Guard has received no asset preservation funding, furthering the maintenance backlog of our facilities and leaving millions of federal dollars on the table. Substandard facilities impact negatively on the readiness of our soldiers. They're also they also constrain our ability to support the citizens of Minnesota in emergencies by limiting our options for basing of forces to uh, fight floods and recover from disastrous weather events or other emergencies. In the department, we work very hard to maximize the impact of federal funding and to protect the resources of the state. But without adequate state commitment to our facilities, our presence in greater Minnesota is threatened. Long-term resource constraints have already driven us to accept the strategy of retrenchment in regard to our presence in less populated regions of Minnesota. Continued underinvestment in our capital assets results in a growing backlog of overdue sustainment requirements, now estimated to be $142 million. It is only a matter of time before the unaddressed maintenance backlog will cause us to accelerate the consolidation and divestiture of our facilities to reduce our ongoing maintenance obligation to a level that the legislator is willing to sustain. Something that I do not want to do. My goal is to remain in our geographically dispersed armories across the state and not become solely tied to our major urban centers. I urge you to work with the leadership to find a way to add sufficient resources to allow the support of, our, of uh, more of our urgent projects. I am proud of the support the Minnesota National Guard receives from its citizens, its employers, and our state and local governments. But to go a sixth consecutive year of an, un, of an underfunded asset preservation bill puts our long-term presence in greater Minnesota at risk. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I stand for any questions. Well, thank you uh, for noting the deficiencies that we have, and uh, I just say 800 million, we'll, we'll see what we can do. Mr. Chair. Yes. Mr. Chair. Who? Oh. Can I just uh, make a Denver. comment? Uh, uh, over the years, I've been in the committees where the, whether it's the uh, military affairs or veterans affairs, when they come into our committees, they're very well versed in and have planned exactly what their needs are going to be in the future. And uh, uh, they spend a lot of time in looking at their facilities. And one thing we have to realize, it's, the, it's a 50-50 match when it comes to uh, state funds and federal funds. And uh, you have to think how many other agencies come to us uh, with, that, uh, with that ability to uh, utilize uh, federal funds with our facilities. So uh, thank you, General, for uh, sharing that with the committee. Thank you. Mr. Chair, Mr. Representative, thank you. Thank, thank you, General. Uh, next up, Eric Rudine from MnDOT and Tony Senna. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm Eric Rudine with MnDOT Government Affairs. And uh, just wanted to um, <coughs> draw your attention to the lack of funding in the bill for the Stone Arch Bridge in Minneapolis. The department and the governor requested close to $13 million for that. And uh, it's in desperate need of repair. In fact, uh, we've recently decided that instead of doing underwater inspections <coughs> of the bridge every five years, we have to now do that every year because of the scouring that's occurring below the water line. It's a very historic structure and if we do not uh, receive funding for repairs eventually we may have to to close that bridge also wanted to uh, express our concern over the earmarks in the bill uh, the department opposes earmarks especially of trunk highway funds because we have an established data-driven process that identifies uh, our highest priority projects through an extensive um, programming process which has MnDOT ever done an earmark uh, Mr. Chair, I, I believe there have been very limited instances where... So when you want one, you'd have one. Yes, Continue, policy. please. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, 
we have many needs across the system, as you know, and the problem is a lack of funding, um, which uh, you can certainly appreciate too many projects and not enough funding. So the, the earmarks in the bill are the uh, 94 interchange uh, at Brockton Lane in Dayton, Argenta Trail in Invergrove Heights, uh, Rockford Road in Plymouth, and Highway 29 in Polk County. Uh, that uh, project in Polk County is was identified in the MnDOT study of uh, rail crossings as the second lowest priority. Uh, there are about six to seven thousand vehicles per day. It's not in the 20 year plan and there really hasn't been a history of crashes in that location. The Rockford Road project, uh, MnDOT does have a redecking of that bridge planned for 2022. Um, we originally were planning that for 2019, but we delayed the project at the request of the city and county uh, to try to give them an opportunity to get additional funds to do more than just a redecking there. And uh, the Brockton interchange, the bill uh, provides 13 and a half million. Um, the total project cost estimate there is about 25.3 million. There are some other funds, uh, about $7 million in federal funds that have been secured and some local funds as well. And uh, the department has a project planned in 2020 and 2021 to, to redo the pavement in that uh, area. And so if funds are available, uh, the interchange would be constructed as part of that project. Thank you, Mr. Chair. No, thank you. And let me just suggest that if you have questions about Brockton, you should go see the majority leader and be careful. <laughs> and uh, regarding the... Uh, uh, the Polk County one, uh, I mean, the problem there is we, we were there. I mean, there can be like 20 minute delays. And if you're an ambulance on one side, you can't cross. And there's really no good route to get around this. I mean, that's, I, I think that uh, you, you could reanalyze the importance of that. Mainly the emergency vehicles. Yeah, uh, Mr. Miller, uh, thank, Representative Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, I believe that the legislature did try to address earmarks and uh, MnDOT's consternation with that with the corridors of commerce. And I believe we put in about $400 million more last year so that we could address some of these specialized projects. And then MnDOT chose to come forward and fund four of their pet projects in the Twin Cities. So if you want to have a problem with the earmarks, you need to work with us on the, on, the, on the projects that we move forward to try and address these special needs. Thank you, Representative Miller. Uh, Representative Jerkins. You covered it, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Next, uh, we have uh, Tony Santa and then uh, Commissioner Casilius. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Um, I want to thank you for hearing our story and for including the city of St. Paul and the Conway Community Center in your bill. I want to give special thanks to Representative Sheldon Johnson, who carried our bill but couldn't be here, and uh, Representative Lilly, who um, helped us present our bill. So thank you, and I hope you get, feel better. Uh, we hope that, um, that there is a state investment in the east side of St. Paul. Um, and we have the opportunity to leverage $10 million of our privately funded money to um, operate the city property for the next 30 years with our partnership with the city of St. Paul on the east side. Thank you for our belief in us and hopefully we'll move forward and we're open for questions in the future. Thank you again, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Thank you very much. Commissioner Casilius and then uh, we have uh, Commissioner Progamiller. Oh. Indeed, You've surprise, changed. Surprise, surprise, Mr. Chair. I've changed so much. Uh, Mr. Chair, members, my name is Ado Shuni. I'm the Director of Government Relations with the Department of Education. Commissioner Caselius unfortunately had to step out for a prior engagement, but we truly appreciate the Chair's um, uh, ability to, to squeeze her in, and I will just speak briefly on her behalf. Um, she wants to thank the, thank the Chair and the Committee for uh, funding some greatly needed areas in the education area, first and foremost. Um, the the, the bonding money for the Red Lake School District um, that they've been coming for um, year after year. 
the roughly $14 million for updates to their early childhood center um, and their elementary school um, to provide those updates so that they can serve their um, youngest learners. Um, they've been coming for funding for um, many years for various projects, um, and um, they've had some success, uh, but um, that's, there's, there's much more to be done. Um, as we all know, their uh, property tax uh, base is quite low, so bonding money is, is, is a great way for them to get these uh, uh, projects um, up and going um, as their uh, student population continues to climb. Um, and we know that the legislature has had a lot of focus on early learning over the past few years, and this would go greatly towards that goal. Um, the commissioner would also like to greatly thank the committee for investment in school safety. Um, we know that that's been a major conversation this session. That's one of the areas where we can all agree um, there's funding in the E through 12 bill and anywhere where we can find more funding to help schools increase the safety for all students and staff members is, is a great way to go. And so we thank the committee for that. And also want to thank um, just the continued investment in school library construction grants. Um, we've seen that. Uh, there's a demand statewide pretty consistently for that. Um, dis, uh, the libraries around the state have done a very good job with their matches every single year. Um, and so we believe that this is... Um, a great way to show that um, we support this continued effort. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uni. That was one of our better ones so far. <laughs> uh, next, we have uh, Commissioner Pogamiller, and then we will take uh, a few minutes for uh, public comments from folks not on the agenda. Commissioner Chairman, Pogamiller. Good afternoon. Good morning. Um, I'm making comments uh, on behalf of the governor's sentiment today. You know, he's pretty committed to higher education in the last couple of years. And so I just wanted to preface that. And he knows how difficult your job is, trust me. But having said that, uh, with regards to pro-secondary, he thinks your bill lacks commitment, <coughs> proportion, and balance. With regards to commitment, the House is about a third of the governor's request. And that's because of the lack of heaper money or asset preservation money. About 210 million less than, the, than he had requested for University of Minnesota for heaper. But about twice more than we did last year. And that's true, Mr. Chairman, he thinks it needs to be ramped up more. <laughs> and about 120 million less than, uh, Min, than his request for Min State. So that's on the level of commitment. On proportion, the, the governor had 38% of his bonding bill for post-secondary education. This bill is 24%. With regards to balance, this bill represent, your bill represents only 20 26% of the governor's request for the University of Minnesota and 45% for Minn State. Then one final thing he wanted to mention is he thinks there's a lack of um, specificity of missing an opportunity with regards to a clinical research facility at the University of Minnesota. We have over, he's got a $10 million down payment for that facility. There's a site available. He notes that there are hundreds of biomedical research firms in the in state of Minnesota that are currently doing projects jointly with universities outside the state of Minnesota. He thinks that could be done more in Minnesota. And uh, that's a jobs issue, and it's a basic research issue. So quality of the university, as well as jobs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Chair. Pogamiller. Uh, Representative Miller. Even shorter than the last one, um, I would certainly hope that also as we move forward that the University of Minnesota addresses um, how they can better utilize their endowment reserves of over $3 billion. So when they come to the state of Minnesota saying we need a couple hundred million dollars that they, that they um, wisely use the money that they already have. I think that's the trouble that I have when the university comes and says we need more money, we need more money, we need more money, when they have over $3 billion sitting there. Mr. Chairman, if I might just comment on that? You might. I um, think you need to put in context when endowment money is made, it is specifically for particular projects. But the point I really want to make about this is the major research institutions in the country have much, the, the competitors to our University of Minnesota have endowments much, much bigger. Harvard, I think, is 36 million. Michigan is over 20 million. Billion. Billion, billion, billion I'm sorry. 
And so three billion is real money. I don't deny that. I'm just saying that in the context of the competition, they do not have an outsized endowment. So what I hear, Mr. Chair, is $3 billion is, no, is nothing. No, Mr. That's what uh, Mr. Chairman, $3 billion is real money. But in comparison to the competition in post-secondary education, <laughs> it's not that much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Don't leave yet. We have uh, Representative Poston, but first, uh, I just want to reply, uh, Commissioner Pogamiller, that we, in, we put down in our bill, we, we included every University of Minnesota request. Mr. So Chairman, that things, is correct. It, you are asking for things that, that weren't on the list that we were given. Mr. Chairman, uh, respectfully, I am not. The governor of the state No, I'm is. sorry. The governor of the state is. I'm sorry. That's and it is a $10 million uh, down payment on a research facility at our major land grant institution. Yes. And, and it's not something that I am opposed to. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Representative Poston. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, on top of the three and a half billion dollars that you have in the endowment uh, fund, you also have about two and a half billion dollars in other reserve funds. And those reserve funds over the last 10 years have grown every single year. And I would ask you, what are you building those reserves funds for? And whatever that is, why aren't you using it? Commissioner Pogamiller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman um, that's a better question for the president of the university rather than myself. Um, what I would say is the, the university, um, in my judgment, as an outside observer, I don't work for the university, is trying to do the best it can to maintain its financial viability through both tuition increases and investments by the state so that it can compete with <coughs> other major land-grant universities like the University of Michigan and the other great universities around the country, or Wisconsin. Well, the Wisconsin, well, I won't say that. I was going to say they're doing some damage to themselves. So, um, so I think the issue is um, neither the legislature or the governor regardless of political party, can manage the University of Minnesota's assets. I think to some extent we have to trust they're doing the best they can with what they have in the market they're dealing with. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Pogamiller. Always good to have you here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate it. And now, um, whoops, did I miss something? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I was just going to comment that you have to be a little bit uh, cautious when you start talking about the university's reserves. Uh, I served a number of years ago with former Governor Carlson on a Blue Ribbon Commission, and uh, there was a lot of publicity at the time about the university's reserves. And in part, it depends on when you take the snapshot. You know, for example, at the beginning of a uh, semester, they're collecting a lot of tuition, but they have obligations throughout the semester. And some people, uh, articles in the Tribune and so on, they were talking about the size of the reserves. And uh, it was greatly inflated at the beginning of a semester as opposed to where it might be at the end. The other thing is that those reserves are necessary if they want to uh, attract a star researcher and they perhaps need to redo some labs and that kind of thing to uh, help recruit. Uh, that was another thing that the reserves were uh, used for. And uh, so the Blue Ribbon Commission, I don't know if that report is still around. It would be worth some people uh, taking a look at because uh, it did uh, provide much better information in terms of as a result of that Blue Ribbon Commission on the uh, purpose and the need for adequate reserves at the University of Minnesota. Representative Poston. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the snapshot that I looked at, Representative Carlson, was 10 years. Mr. Chairman, I, I'm not sure what you mean by 10 years. Are you talking an average? I looked, or? I looked at 10 years of uh, the reserve balance. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, it's gone up basically a uh, billion and a half dollars in the last 10 years. So I've looked at it increase every year for the last 10 years. Um, so I'm not looking at a snapshot of just a, a, a moment in time during the year. 
I understand exactly what you said, and you're right. There are different times when that fund balance can be higher than others, but I looked at 10 years. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Thank you, Appreciate Mr. Bogan Miller. Uh, next, uh, Mr. Freeman, I think. Wait. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, Jeff Freeman, the Executive Director of the Public Facilities Authority. I want to uh, thank you for uh, the significant amount of money, $120 million in the bill for the PFA water infrastructure programs. The amount and the split between grants and loans, wastewater and, and drinking water will allow us to fund all of the projects that are in line for 2018 construction. That's a great thing. However, I am concerned that there will be very little to carry forward for 2019 projects. As you know, we work from a five-year priority list with projects in various stages of planning and design. Many cities are now working on projects that are on track for 2019 construction and will need the state assistance. If there is an opportunity to do so, I encourage you to approve the governor's full $167 million uh, request so that projects in the pipeline can keep moving on schedule. Um, in addition, I have serious concerns about the language in Article 2, Section 4. The language is, is entitled Supplemental Grants, but in reality, it would create a totally different grant structure that would undermine existing programs and have several negative consequences. This would be bad policy. Current programs combine low interest loans and very specifically targeted grants based on affordability criteria and treatment requirements. Grants can be up to 80%, but there's always a local share that we then would finance with uh, the low interest loans. The proposed supplemental language would establish essentially an automatic grant of at least 50% and for many cities up to 100% for any project that they wanted to do. This proposal would take away incentives to reduce project costs, to explore regionalization and potential <coughs> lower cost alternatives, and to use asset management to maximize the useful life of cities' facilities. The proposal would also hurt our ability to fully utilize federal funds through our partners, USDA Rural Development. Finally, even without any funding attached to it, the, by putting that language in statute, it creates a commitment to provide automatic 100% grants. Cities in the pipeline will put their projects on hold until they, and, and with that expectation, and until those grant funds are available, this pr proposal would move us backward and put Mer Minnesota further and further behind in keeping up with water infrastructure needs. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Freeman. Seeing no questions, we'll move on to Stephanie Chapel. For your time today. My name is Stephanie Chapel, and I come from a long line of military service folks. I'm against the $30 million historic Fort Snelling project. The Historical Society misled and used incorrect information to gain advantage onto the bonding bill. The Society created a catchy phrase for an ad campaign, hashtag HFS 2020. It means Historic Fort Snelling turns 200 in the year 2020. The society knows that's not true. The correct year is 2025. The society uses false 2020 date to gain public support and legislative support and made it a major selling point on its bonding application. Planning excluded veterans veterans organizations, and even early Minnesota soldiers and settlers. 
The current design is unbalanced and unwelcoming. The military has no permanent gallery or exhibit space. There's no flags. There's no military insignia on any of the designs. None. David Kelleher of the Minnesota Historical Society confirmed only one of three design phases was complete. They're not even close to construction. Further, the Minnesota Historical Society has no stable leadership. Mr. Elliott resigns June 1st. This, the new CEO doesn't begin until July 1st, and he has no experience with historic Fort Snelling. Minnesota Historical Society needs to go back to the drawing board and submit an honest and accurate bonding application for a balanced project and do it in a way that respects and honors the military. Thank you. And thank you. And one comment that I, I want to make to this whole issue is that you have interpretation and you have historic restoration. And those are two separate things. What we are dealing with is the restoration part, and I'm not linking interpretation to restoration. Uh, I might share some of your concerns about interpretation, but that's a, a battle to continue on another day. The restoration part for historic Fort Snelling is included in subsection three of the 10 million and covers $3 million specifically for historic Fort Snelling. Y yes, and what I'm saying is, I'm, I'm separating restoration from interpretation. Uh, it is not our uh, purview here to deal with interpretation. We deal with the building and the restoration and the interpretation, that's another issue to be dealt with later on. Thank you. Um, let's see, who, next. Anyone else in the public who wishes to testify? Thank you, Chair. You're welcome. welcome. Committee members, uh, Tom Diamond, uh, Vietnam vet, and I'm here to speak on uh, what's missing is uh, House File 4060, uh, Representative Sheldon Johnson and uh, Jim Davney. And this is really an important issue, uh, certainly for veterans. There's a real shortage of uh, skilled care beds in the state of Minnesota, but this is not a universal shortage. There are 808 beds that are allotted for skilled care uh, from the federal VA. So with the eight districts, it's uh, eight congressional districts, it's 101 beds per uh, district. Currently, the seventh congressional district has 106 beds. The first congressional district has 85, uh, and the eighth congressional district has uh, 83. The second, third, fourth, fifth and sixth districts only has access to 60 beds each. It's greatly underserved. The veterans in those districts are greatly underserved. Uh, so proposals that have been put out would actually increase that uh, disparity. It would, it would make, it would provide 414 beds for the veterans in three congressional districts, while there would only be 300 beds for the veterans served in five congressional districts. There would only be one veteran home to serve five congressional districts. There'd be six veterans homes to three, serve three congressional districts. And this has real uh, consequences because if you take a look at the wait times, where the wait times are here are the ones uh, serving the veterans in the second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth congressional district. Wait times are generally over a year. This is not true of the other uh, uh, veterans' homes. Literally, veterans are dying from lack of being able to get into the veterans' home here. Uh, a veteran who died not long ago was waiting for 13 months to get into the Minneapolis veterans' home and when he just got close enough that he could see that he was gonna get in there, he passed away without care. That's the reality of what is happening. And this, uh, the legislature, the, the House, promised in 2013 and the MDVA that there will be 100 additional beds to make up for the, the actual loss. There's been 150 beds lost at the veterans' home. 
there will be 100 beds to replace the uh, additional beds at that home. It's in print. It's the, the adopted policy of the, le the legislature and uh, the MDVA. And part of that agreement was that the 91 beds in Building 6 would be retained. There wouldn't be a loss of any of those beds. Those beds have been serving uh, veterans for decades. Those beds were just quit. They quit filling those beds. Uh, uh. I'm sorry, Mr. Diamond. We've, we've given you over a minute extra. And I'd just like to say that, you know, as you have pointed out, we are doing three more homes. And there is a connection with some bonding action here with those homes. And I, I think those three homes are going to certainly help. And, uh, you know, maybe more needs to be done in the future, but that's what we're doing right now. Sure. So thank you. Thank you for your time. I'll give you a hand up. Does anyone else wish? Okay, you've got a couple minutes. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Roland Hall, Mayor of Wabasha, Minnesota. We drove up here this morning, Rolf and I, to express face-to-face -face our appreciation for including us in the bonding bill. However, I'm finding that the best way that we can express our appreciation is stay within that 122nd window that the chair has asked for. We think that we, by partnering with the state, we have a lot of good things going on in Wabasha and that area, and there'll be a big payback, not only for our area, but for the region and for the state of Minnesota. Rolf? Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Chair and representatives. I think uh, the mayor of Wabasha said it uh, very succinctly and within the time limit. Thank you very much for recognizing the, the statewide asset that we have with the National Eagle Center in, in, located in Minnesota. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I was going to say we couldn't end on a better one than that, but apparently we do have another one. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Mary Hartnett with the Commission of Deaf, Deaf, Blind, and Hard of Hearing Minnesotans. We want to thank you very much for the $2 million in asset preservation and hope I... The, uh, when the bill gets off the floor, that there is some money for the safety and um, security corridor that the Academy has requested for the 75% of staff who are deaf um, and the students who are deaf, deafblind, and hard of hearing. Thank you so much for your investment. Thank you. Come on down. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Scott Butel. I'm the Public Policy Director with Minnesota Department of Human Rights. I actually just wanted to bring your attention to one policy provision in the bill, which would actually have no impact on your target. So I'm not asking for a project. Um, contained within the governor's proposal um, in Article 2, Sections 10 and 11, there's some provisions to extend workforce participation goals to all bonding projects. Currently, most bonding projects are covered, but depending on the entity that actually does the contracting, certain projects are or are not covered. This is something that's been included in the governor's bonding proposal last year and now again this year, and we are hoping that this will make it into the final bill. As we saw on the People's Stadium project, the Viking Stadium project, and on the Capitol, there were some really positive impacts for participation by both women and people of color in terms of those workforces by working with contractors to make good faith efforts on that. And so we hope that that success can be extended out to more projects. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> and now, Mr. Heller. Thank you, Chair, and, and Mr. people Heller. on the Capitol Vessel. Rick Heller, unofficially represent the twice exceptional people with print disabilities. You got two minutes. I come here to speak on 4404, but first of all, it would be important that they post these documents online in a timely manner and for respect for the chair and their, and their staff. But when people come to these meetings, they give them to them electronically in a 24 hour so they can post it online to provide more fairness, sameness, mm -hmm. and timely transparency for everybody at the Minnesota Legislature. Mr. Heller, they're posted 24 hours in advance. 
data requests from state departments will will show that. However, uh, they don't submit them uh, 24 hours in advance. I gave you a handout. There's nothing posted online today, as you look at that. So, uh, just for the record, um, uh, it's my understanding that uh, infrastructure is an important piece as it relates to this bill bonding. However, it's, it's legacy that look, looks at programming. And I can assure you that both need to apply Minnesota Statute 16E.03 subdivision 9, which state agencies and some schools which just in Minnesota have to apply. And if we're going to provide more uh, successful engagement as relates to fairness and sameness and timely transparency, we need to start considering how that places in to the digital accessibility for everybody in the state of Minnesota uh, to be involved in this process. Thank you for this opportunity to speak on this. Thank you, Mr. Heller. And seeing no one else that wishes to come up to speak, either with concerns or to thank us, uh, we will uh, move on to the amendments. And uh, just a few of them. Uh, the first one that we have uh, is the A1, uh, Representative Eklund. Are you offering that one? I'll move oh, the A1 amendment, okay. Mr. Chair. I'm sorry. Wait a second. Oh, I've got to do the. I have to do my A5 delete all first. Now I'm confused. The authors. We did. Okay. Now I got it. I am doing my author's amendment now. <laughs> All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. Prevails. And now, Representative. Eckler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Now I'll move the A1 amendment, if that is All right. the pleasure of the chair. A1 amendment has been moved. You have some comments. Well, this just cleans up some language for the DNR on being able to uh, uh, purchase and or fix some of their uh, buildings as far as the DNR's asset preservation uh, <coughs> program in, this, in the bill. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Eklund. Uh, the chair would support this one. Any further discussion? Those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Prevails. Uh, next is the A19, Representative Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this amendment has to do with uh, the longstanding practice of uh, uh, pre-design requirements on, on capital projects with bonding money, um, and that's certainly a safeguard that I want to see in place. Uh, on projects to make sure that the projects move forward that we bond for um, they can actually afford to do it in the end However, there are some exceptions to those and I'd like to add one of those exceptions if you if you look towards the end uh, It's just three words freight rail projects It falls in line with what we already allow for passenger rail projects and light rail lines and transit stations This is a, the railroad companies are long-standing They know how to spend the money properly and I'd like your support on this amendment well, thank you, Representative Miller. You have my support on this amendment. Fantastic. Uh, any further comments? Those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The amendment prevails. Uh, Representative Detmer, A2. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I, I thank you for allowing me to just talk about this. Uh, I'm not sure it's, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna withdraw it, but uh, I think it's important that people understand uh, the city of Stillwater has an issue, especially with the flooding going on right now. The, and uh, this has been an issue for several years now with the eroding of the bank. Uh, if you've ever, if you've been down to Stillwater and got on the, pat, the big uh, paddle wheel boats down there, that the uh, bank along that river is eroding away. And the main sewer line for the city goes right along that bank and uh, it's eroding, and, and uh, we have a problem where we could have raw sewage going into the St. Croix River. Um, the city has already committed 1.6 million. Uh, we're asking for 3.3, uh, 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 and uh, this money would go to the DNR, and uh, which the DNR apparently would be overseeing the project. Um, my concern to the DNR is if this is an important project, uh, maybe the DNR should be handling this project <laughs> and, uh, and funding it uh, through their own funds. So that's, uh, I'm, a little di I'm disappointed in the DNR that uh, this project has gotten to this point where it's eroding away. What the city wants to do, they want to add 12, they, 
There's about 12 feet of the bank that has been eroding over the years, and the sewer line is exposed, the manhole is exposed, and it's underwater right now. So uh, this is a project that I think is important, and uh, hopefully uh, maybe the, as we go forward here that the uh, chair would maybe reconsider this project. So I withdraw at this point. Well, thank you, Representative Detmer, and uh, we'll be in contact with DNR and try to see what's going on with this. Uh, you have the uh, A4 amendment as well. That's right, Mr. Chair, and uh, A4 amendment, uh, there's no cost to it. Uh, it was brought to my attention by the counties. Uh, the, uh, the A4 amendment leverages state flood mitigation grants uh, program also to meet the state's sat statutory obligation to mitigation of wetlands. Like when you put in a road and so forth, uh, there's, uh, you have to mitigate the, the wetlands. It provides that if a wetland is created in the course of building a flood mitigation project, uh, that the newly created wetland can be used for offset wetlands lost in construction projects, adding the turn lanes of, the, of a road and so forth. I carried th this type of legislation before for Washington County uh, and Anoka County. So again, uh, uh, I would uh, definitely like this uh, part of your project and uh, there's no cost to the state. Uh, thank you, Representative Detmer. Other comments, questions? And Bowser uh, uh, has approved it, too. All right. Uh, thank you, Representative Detmer. Uh, those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Prevails. <laughs> Did I hear a no? You say no. All right. At this point, uh, seeing no other amendments, uh, we will have the uh, general discussion on the bill. Did we do the A5? Yeah. Did we do A5? What? Oh. <coughs> Representative Hausman? Uh, uh, did, did we act on the A5 or is no one offering that? We did it right away. Well, I, I was a little bit, I made a little mistake. I got back to it and we did it. Uh, Representative Constantine, do you have your hand up or were you? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. Um, Going back to the bonding and tours this summer, um, I just wanted to point out that uh, when we were in Jackson, um, that Representative Lilly did show uh, remarkable abilities to climb at, um, uh, what was that, West uh, Community College as he climbed up the pole um, and did manage not to fall on that particular day. Um, so he does have some skills there. But <laughs> as I was thinking about that, I don't remember touring um, the bill the project that was in the bill. Um, and I don't actually remember seeing that bill come forward either. And so I am kind of curious as to where that came from that it ended up in the bill. Um, the city of Jackson redevelopment, we were in Jackson, we didn't tour anything there. Um, and again, I don't remember seeing a bill either. So I was kind of curious as to where that came from. Maybe Representative Lilly could see it from where he was. He was way up there. I mean, uh, he did uh, surprise me that he even tried that. So he does, like I say, he does have skills. But like I said, that kind of triggered the fact that we were there. We didn't tour anything there other than the junior college. And I don't recall us talking about it in committee either. Representative Gunther. Thank oh, you, Mr. Chairman, it was presented in Mankato with a lot of other projects. Some of them were yours, I believe. Uh, mm. Well. At least your mayor was involved in some of them there. And uh, it's, a, it's a veterans park that is along the river. And it was presented and uh, it uh, seemed like a very worthy thing to have. And uh, that was in my, one of my cities. So it was presented to the Capital Investment Committee in Mankato twice. In Mankato? And we had meetings where people presented their proposals in Mankato. You were there. Um, Representative Constantine, we're just trying to piece together our memories of this. <laughs> well, I'm not the only one that doesn't remember this then, obviously. Um, uh, if you recall, uh, Representative Gunther had a car accident and for most of our trips was not with us. However, he did come over to Jackson and did talk to uh, members about this 
uh, when he was there. Oh, we should have stopped by and seen it then while we were in Jackson. Uh, that probably would have yeah. helped my memory then. It, it was talked about. Let's just put it that Okay. Way. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Gunther. We would be very happy to give you a private tour. Oh, we'll okay. Well, I don't want to see uh, Representative Lilly go up that pole, though, again. <laughs> I don't either. I think he's had enough of wooden pole. My Representative Dean. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And now I'm a little bit concerned about being on this committee and having accidents. Uh, <laughs> Mine was whooping cough. Yeah. Um, but. Mine, mine was dumb. Yeah, well, <laughs> we all do dumb things occasionally, uh, Representative Lilly, and we won't hold this against you. It's really great to see you here. So, so Mr. Chair, I, I, I'm, I'm impressed with what you've been able to put together with such a tiny, tiny target. Uh, Clearly, I've looked through this bill, and I've just looked at some general things like asset preservation, which we've really shortchanged a lot, and I, I, I'm pretty sure you're aware of that. In, Mr. <clears throat> in every category where they asked for asset preservation, I think we tried to give it to them. We just shrunk Yeah, it. yeah, and, 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 and I understand that. <clears throat> and, you know, asset preservation is one of those things. If you don't fund it, it just keeps getting worse. Uh, and at some point, not only this committee, but this legislature needs to make a decision. Either we're going to seriously fund asset preservation or we're really not going to fund it anymore and it's going to fall on to those agencies, to those universities and to those, um, you know, uh, local jurisdictions to actually resolve that. So when I look at that, if you generally double most of the asset preservation here, and then, of course, if you double the, uh, you know, the local projects, which is only in the $80 million range, I think we're, 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 we're not at where the governor was at 1.5, but that brings us to just over $1.1 billion, uh, which given that our capacity is over $3.5 billion, that's like one third of our capacity. So I would hope that as this, um, as this bonding bill moves forward, that we'll begin to see uh, not only an increase in, in, in a dollar amount, but meeting the needs of a lot of these uh, local places, uh, cities, townships, and other areas. And, and, you know, I'm really disappointed that my fav one of my favorite projects is not in here. And I'm guessing you'll have difficulty getting the tax chairs uh, vote without the Chatfield project in here, uh, and, 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 and maybe as we... Many tears were shed. Yeah, I, 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 ho I hope there were. Um, so, so I would just, you know, hope that as you move forward and as you begin to have conversations with the Senate and Republican leadership that we can actually put forward a bonding bill that, that really meets the needs that our state currently has so that we're not having the same conversation every time a bonding bill comes up, that we're just not doing what we need to do. But uh, again, I commend the effort, and uh, that will be it for my comments. Thank you, Representative Dean. Uh, Representative Hausman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> First of all, this, since this may be our last uh, committee meeting, I know I speak for members of my caucus that we're very grateful to you and your staff who have been very accommodating and easy and pleasant to work with and, and, and all of the touring and, and discussion around this and, and so we thank you for that. As I was listening to all the testimony, what I found myself thinking is I wish the Speaker of the House and the Majority Leader of the Senate uh, could have been in the room to listen to uh, all of the, the testimony that, that we heard because um, obviously um, there's a lot of urgency and a lot of needs. I wanted to speak just about a couple of things about higher education. Um, and that is, um, I know the English department at the University of Minnesota is more uh, grateful than one can possibly imagine. They have been working for Pillsbury <laughs> Hall for years and years and years. And uh, they did a 20 year anniversary uh, <laughs> last week celebrating. And, 
Uh, I don't know if you got to the, the, the Kaler House. We were having a celebration. We were on the House floor, and so uh, I, I didn't get there. Uh, but I know that there are just many people celebrating that. Um, I'm grateful in Minnesota State you um, uh, honored the priorities of the system uh, and stuck to those priorities. I'm hoping if there is a little more capacity that we might take one more look at the five additional campuses um, that have small requests uh, because when we do every one of these we also take something off of the deferred maintenance list and so in a sense we add to some of the uh, of the asset preservation uh, needs and and so um, it, I think those are worth mentioning um, it, it does occur to me since Representative Lilly is here <laughs> and worked so hard on this we're very grateful for the 10 million in Metro Parks but I thought in uh, honor of this special visit, maybe we should keep trying for 15 million. <laughs> so we'll, we'll see about that. Um, but I, I just thought... Um, we'll keep you off the monkey bars. <laughs> um, it does sound as though uh, there continues to be some possibility uh, for additional um, bonding authority and additional cash. And so um, I more than most know that when you start with four billion dollars worth of requests and you have to write a bill for less than a billion you're going to say no more often than you say yes and um, but I thought I would at least mention maybe some of the most glaring uh, areas of underinvestment as we uh, continue in this next uh, week or so. Um, Heaper for the University of Minnesota and Minnesota State has been mentioned. Uh, we had testimony about the uh, from Bowser about RIM, and I think that would be worth underscoring that um, they started with a request of $30 million, which would have leveraged $69.9 million of USDA funds. And because we're only at a third of that, it means um, that we uh, have, have not quite maximized uh, federal match dollars. I thought we were about <laughs> $40 million in applications to date, but I think I heard her testify that it's really closer to, to um, 55 million. Um, just a word about um, an area, of course, that's near and dear to me, and that is the affordable housing. Um, and I want to speak just a minute about the request of 30 million for public housing. Um, the bill provides uh, 6.7 million. Public housing uh, serves some of the lowest income residents of the state. They are seniors. They are persons with disabilities. They are families with children. Nearly 75% of the residents of public housing have incomes under 15000 per year. Um, the housing infrastructure bonds, the, the one thing I wanted to say about <coughs> them is there is a link to the permanent support of housing to this new thing that's funded in this bill, and that is the mental health crisis centers. And here is my one concern about that. It's a new program. And uh, it solves a problem, but if we don't do more of the permanent supportive housing, we still don't solve the problem. I think Senator Senjim and others initially thought we are right now sometimes discharging persons with uh, a mental uh, illness diagnosis to the street because they're ready to leave uh, the hospital or the emergency room and there is no <coughs> permanent housing, and so they're discharged to the street. And I think the idea of the mental health crisis centers was one of the solutions to that. The dilemma is there are 14 beds, limited to 14 beds, and they're limited to, is it 60 or 90 days? I don't even know what the, what the time frame is. It isn't in the language of the bill. but um, So it means they get discharged. There is a short-term place. But if we don't also continue to aggressively do the permanent supportive housing, there still is no permanent place for them to move to. So we run the risk of discharging from them from the mental health crisis centers to the street. And so we've got, I think, a lot of work to do there yet. Um, because I believe we might still have some opportunities in the next week or so, I thought I would just call a few out um, that people have spoken to me about. And one of those is the Safe Routes to School, which uh, has no funding. Um, MnDOT has its first and second request. They mentioned the Stone Arch Bridge. Uh, their second request is uh, the Rochester bus garage, and so we, we have, uh, have no money at this point for MnDOT's number one and number two priority. Those of you who toured remember our visit to the St. Peter Dietary Building. We were sweating like heck on that hot day in that hot place and wonder how it would be to work there, and uh, that is not in the build, uh, bill at this point. 
Uh, we're still working on, uh, no, there's no funding for ports, there's no funding for the Chatfield Center for the Arts or the Hennepin Center for the Arts. They have been waiting to complete their project for a number of years. Um, no funding for the, re the revitalize the zoo. We had an opportunity to um, uh, to tour that. We heard uh, from Met Council no funding for arterial BRT development, uh, and so we don't move forward on that front. So um, there are challenges ahead. Um, I uh, I'm looking at the at the audience when I speak this because everybody the chair has worked hard to get this message about needs as because it's other people who are making the decision about the size of the bill. And that's where the public comes in. I've pleaded as everybody has visited my office, everybody has to help us with the size of the bill because the bigger the bill, the more likely your project is in it and your asset preservation is funded and the smaller the bill, the less likely. So everyone has a stake in this. We stay well within our debt capacity guidelines, but, but here I think members of the public in this next week uh, still have the opportunity to help us and um, and also to encourage us to work together uh, sooner rather than later and not wait to the last minute so we don't make mistakes and run out of time. There is so much at stake in this bill uh, that leads to uh, an economy that's healthy and competitive and uh, so we obviously all we, we need the <coughs> support of everyone in the state of Minnesota to help us get this job done and to do it well. Thank you, Mr. Chair, very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Representative Hausman. Representative Miller. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I have uh, just a few comments, but I want the first comment to be that I want to thank you for the work that you've done. And um, uh, being somewhat of more of a reluctant participant, Gavin knows that being on the bonding committee kind of makes me itchy and scratchy. But I think that you've done a very good job in uh, handling what this is and handling the personalities and, and, and being very positive about things, and I do appreciate that. And on that positive note, I promised that I would be positive with my comments. So as you're hearing my things, just remember this is me being positive. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, just a couple comments, that, and, and, and this really is intended to make a point in the end that uh, uh, Representative Grossel made that I want to make sure to give him credit for is uh, if we're going to spend it, spend it wisely. Okay, so the couple thoughts I have is is 825 billion is what we're looking at, and I know that the, the requests and the needs may be greater, uh, but I do bristle a little bit with the it isn't enough or it isn't much. Um, where I come from, I blew up at, grew up in a blue collar family, and I can tell you 825 million dollars is a lot of money. Okay, and we did a, we did about a billion dollars last year, so it isn't like we're we're Scrooge McDuck and we aren't doing anything. Um, with a capacity of three billion, I just first of all that number is structured in such a way it's it's defined in parameters. I think our capacity is is what people are more than con what they're comfortable with willing to spend. I have problems when we grow this because if, if I have these numbers right, we have about 1.2 billion in debt service each year that we pay. That's not going into these projects per biennium. That we're, that's not going into these projects uh, that could be used for. Um, I would like to see in the future some safeguards, uh, some balance sheets, and some RFPs. Uh, you know, I think when the University of Minnesota comes and says we have these different asset preservation projects, um, I agree that they have asset preservation, but I'd like a little bit more information. <laughs> I use the example not just because it's in my town and not just because it's an important project for me. But anyone that has seen the Montevideo proposal for their veterans' home, if they've seen the physical proposal for that, and I know this committee has because they've handed it out, they've worked 11 years on their project, raised $4 million against the project where the state is in it for about 10. So they've raised 40% of that. They've updated that proposal every year. And I will tell you it answers every question that someone might have. They invested heavily in that. And I would encourage anyone that comes to the, this committee with proposals that they take a look at a book like that because it gives us the information necessary to see, okay, we see what your priorities are, we understand it. And I will tell you that if you're asking for anything more than $250,000, you have time to put together that information for us. Um, I would like to see, I think you did really good on your priorities and at the risk of sounding like I'm challenging those priorities, I'm not, just want to punctuate one of them. Um, I am very sensitive to military affairs and veteran affairs. 
Uh, my dad served in Korea. I served. My brother served. My son is now currently serving in the Minnesota National Guard. And um, on my floor speech last night, I, I kind of made the point that if we're going to serve anyone, we need to serve those people who are literally willing to die for us. That's a very humbling thing. And I can tell you that what the general was talking about with the assets in greater Minnesota, one of the reasons why we have those assets in greater Minnesota is because that's where we have young men like my son willing to serve this great nation. And I don't want him to have to travel for three hours when he's already agreeing to serve. That's why those assets are out there. So I certainly think, I look at military affairs and veteran affairs and I don't think that they have $5 billion in reserve assets. Um, that they can attest to. So I certainly hope that we look at that. I agree this number is probably going to go up. I think everyone in this room is kind of assuming the number goes up. And as we move forward, that makes your job even more difficult, Mr. Chair. So I, I, I give you great honor and praise in that. And I give you uh, a great challenge ahead to work with the Senate, which will certainly be a challenge in the governor's office. But I'm excited to see what comes ahead. And thank you. <clears throat> Representative Jurgens. Thank you, Mr. Chair. First of all, I just want to say that this being my first term, uh, first year on this committee, how much I have enjoyed it. I think that the bonding tours, I, I was along on every single one of them, and that's a, a very valuable part of the process. Uh, it helps us when we get back here and we, and we are reminded of the projects. Um, we were there. We, can, we have pictures of them. We remember Leon climbing the pole. We remember things about the projects. And so that's a very, uh, a very valuable, valuable part of the process. Um, I think this is a good bill. Uh, there are many projects in here that I like, that I was glad to see made the cut, made it in here. Um, not everything that I wanted is in here, as everyone here can, can attest to the same. Uh, some things are funded, but not to the level that I would have liked to have seen. But I appreciate the, the difficulty of the job that you have in sorting through the requests and um, paring it down to what we, the number that we have to work with. So I want to thank you for that. Uh, I look forward to the next steps, whether there is a, a, a larger number that comes or not. I want to thank you for the work that you've done, and I'm uh, happy that I have been a part of it. Thank you. Uh, Representative Hansen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I have some concerns in Article 2, but I'm not going to raise them right now. I'm going to just directly beg you to provide money to West St. Paul. For what? To provide money to West St. Paul to reimburse them for the state highway that goes through their community. That they are currently $17 million in debt because they paid for it. I beg you. Nothing else has worked for four years. And Representative Hanson, you have done a, a good job of uh, making this aware, of making us aware of this. And uh, we'll certainly be uh, looking to, you know, to do what we can do. Right now we have 8.5 million in cash, and you need cash, and so we will see. We will see where the process takes us. But I do appreciate uh, your participation on the committee and uh, and your uh, uh, ardor and candor in bringing forth your issues, including this one. Representative Eklund. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and. Uh, Appreciate the time. This is uh, directed to the Historic Society. Um, I had a bonding project that, at their request, I did not push. So, in the part of this asset preservation portion that you have, I want to see where uh, Grand Mound fits into your plans. The folks of Coochin County certainly deserve some answers, and I would like to see where they're at. Thank you. Uh, there was a concert on it. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, given the constraints that you were working under from your leadership, um, as far as the, the amount of money, um, I feel like you have done an outstanding job, and I want to thank you. Um, I would like to point out there are two things as we move forward um, that I hope will remain in play. The um, kitchen 
at St. Peter, I believe is truly dangerous. Um, ha asking um, people to work in 100, 120 degrees um, while they're trying to prepare the food. I think we're just looking at a potential for somebody to have a heart attack or heat stroke. And I think that is truly a dangerous working situation. The other thing is, from my days on the city council, if you have assets, you need to protect them. And if there's any way to get some more money for Heber, um, I was at South Central College and walking around trash cans and garbage cans as the water was coming through the roofs. And I know there are others. Um, again, if that's just something that can remain in play, I would hope we could look at that. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Constantine. I appreciate that. And, uh, you know, keep in mind that we, we did go three-fourths of the way down the, the Minsky, Minnesota right. state list. And a lot of those things uh, are asset preservation. That wasn't criticism, Mr. Well, I, Chair. I I'm just explaining. Representative Sock. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as you're aware, I've had um, concerns about one element of this whole process, and that is the setting of expectations. I think our system here invites a, a, an ending that is going to be replete with disappointment. We make believe that the quality of the presentation or the quality of the argument is significant in whether or not you'll get there. It doesn't matter whether you're a city of 600 people or a University of Minnesota. And I think it is, it, it, the system creates the disappointment. And I, I would offer that we, I think, would be much better served as a society, a whole state, if we knew going in that there were bans that had to be satisfied before we moved to other bans. My way of illustrating that, and this is just me, but I think a better system could be developed in this ideal, is that state-owned buildings, so you, you might click through that real quick in your head. It starts with these buildings here, goes down the university to the University of Minnesota, it goes out to the state. Minnesota State. No. If you took all of that and said that's the first band, if we don't satisfy the physical stewardship in that band, we don't move on. That means that if that's where we are in expectation. So there's two elements to this. One is this kabuki game that we play with the number. So we've got the city of Rochester asking for $4 million for a bus garage because they think it might be there if the number's right. Well, what a silly game that is. What city should plan in that kind of an environment? I don't buy this system. I think that there could be other bands that would come in, whether it be assets that are owned by local governments, counties, then cities. The last thing we get to then are entertainment factors, things that we just think are cool. We see all kinds of expectations here and, and requests and all of that, and I, I think we have become so deluded in what we're considering that we're forcing ourselves into artificial judgments. So that's what I would offer. I am amazed at, at the evenness of hand that was exhibited by the, the chair and or whoever his close counselors would be. When, you're, when you have a number that is so low and you have a system that invites such ambiguous requesting, and you, you, you know, we invited requests that would have out of the block been somewhere between three and four billion dollars. There was no doubt. I think we all knew that when we got up in the morning and the first day opened up the request sheets. We knew it was going to be that big because that's the system we have. If we know we're going to be dealing with a budget and somebody needs to get in front of these kinds of things, somebody needs to say, hey, this year is going to be between, I don't care, make up some numbers, eight, but no more than 900 million. Well, if that's it, I think there's a lot of requests that would understand, you know what, this is just not my year. So I, 
I'm, I'm disappointed in the system, not in the action of the people. I think the, everybody that's functioning here is functioning at a very high level, very high level of discernment, a very high level of fairness. But I am very concerned that we're functioning in an old system that has just gotten away. So thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Representative Sock. Representative Frankie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll be brief. I just want to say thank you. Thank you to the staff. Thank you to the committee. And I want to throw one more quick plug in for the Avivo program, should more money become available. Okay, thank you. Uh, Representative Carlson. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, I uh, <clears throat> want to join the chorus of saying uh, thank you. I think you did a, uh, uh, a good job with limited resources. Um, I kind of know the, knew that this discussion or, uh, was going to take place when we passed the budget resolution in Ways and Means. Um, I raised many of the questions that you're hearing about now there. Um, and uh, I do know, um, although I don't know what all the commitments that the uh, Chair of Ways and Means have made, but uh, <clears throat> there seems to be a desire on both sides of the aisle that uh, there may be some opportunity to have the bill grow a bit. And uh, I think that uh, probably the next step is to have that uh, discussion because I assume that uh, the chair's motion uh, will pass that refers this to uh, ways and means. And uh, if there uh, is some uncommitted dollars there, and I have a pretty good feeling that there is, I do follow that fairly closely. Um, and uh, the first step in that process would be to uh, bring the budget resolution forward <laughs> for an amendment. And then the second step in that process would be to adjust the bottom line number for the capital investment uh, bill. And uh, I uh, <coughs> think that uh, if that were to be the case, then uh, some of us have to uh, uh, engage in what some of the next steps might be, and I think you're hearing what some of the concerns are here today, the likes. It's not directed uh, so much as what's in the bill, but the desire to have perhaps uh, either some things enhanced and or perhaps some projects that unfortunately uh, haven't quite made it in yet. But uh, I suspect that discussion will be taking place fairly soon. But I do want to thank you for your work, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank you. And I do want to thank your staff as well, by the way. Uh, I do know, uh, having uh, been involved through the years, uh, putting together some of those site visits, and uh, uh, they were well organized, and uh, I think uh, we should be sure to compliment uh, your staff for uh, their input in, in having that done so well. Thank you. Thank you. And just a brief comment. As I look around this table and see all of these untanned faces, <laughs> and I look at uh, Commissioner uh, former Representative Atkins who just walked in. You see, guys, that's what happens when you don't have to sit in here all spring. <laughs> uh, Representative Grossel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I just want to tell everybody, uh, you, yourself and all the staff, uh, thank you for all the, all the hard work that you've done. And it's been a, a, a pleasure to work with all, everybody around this, uh, around this committee. Um, I'm just going to jump on the, uh, the, the wagon with uh, Chair Detmer and uh, Representative Miller is, is in reference to we've got these programs or these projects from, uh, for the National Guard that I think would be some very, give, give some very serious thought to. It's, uh, it's money that's waiting uh, for them to utilize to upgrade from the federal aspect. And if, we're, if, it's, if we have to spend more than, like I said, uh, let's, let's uh, make some wise investments. And I agree with uh, Representative Sock's uh, approach that get the stuff done that needs to be done. The rest of it uh, we'll, we'll address as we, as we can. Uh, thank but you. Then, Representative Lilly. Yes, sir. Glad you're still with us. Thank you, Glad sir. you're still with us. Thank and I hope you heal up well. Thank you, sir. Representative Detmer. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, again, uh, Representative Grussell, Rep Representative Miller uh, made some good comments. And I just want to remind the committee and, and uh, the chair uh, Again, uh, when we're looking at our military affairs, that uh, for every dollar that uh, the state spends, the federal dollar will come in also. So we need, I don't know how many other uh, projects uh, will do that for us. So let's uh, keep looking at our, 
our uh, facilities for our National Guard. Thank you, and thank you for your work, Chair. Thank you. Representative Lilly. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, uh, members, I, I, I'm not sure exactly where to start, but uh, I'll just kind of start there at the end because you were talking about the veterans kind of things, and uh, a couple of us are on um, stake of finance, too, and just like to add, the, I, if there is gap somewhere, I, sometimes I really wish as a state we'd, we'd just fund them straight up and do it ourselves right and get it done. And, because when those folks are there and we look them in the eye and we know what they've done for us and we all value them from every corner of the state, uh, the folks that have worked for us, I just wish we'd figure out a way to, and I kind of personally think bonding wouldn't be a bad way to build them and then pay for them ourselves. But anyways, I don't want to get into all that, but um, please don't blame uh, Minnesota West uh, for for my climbing uh, mishap, but uh, I... Just in closing, I want to you know thank everybody for the card, and uh, I just I asked to be on this committee, and I'm here on on purpose. I'm uh, um, I'm still a little sore, but uh, um, you know I got really attached to to every one of you, you know, and then and you get attached to these projects too. I don't think people realize so even the ones that you cut, and so it's I mean you, I hope people don't think it's easy. Um, for any of us, and uh, we, it, there's so many good things, and yeah, there can be more, but uh, um, it's 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 uh, it's a great state we have, you know, and to be able to travel like we all have been able to do, and uh, and just kind of final in closing, I wanted to defend uh, Chair Gunther for a second because one year you guys did a little uh, uh, in capital investment, we did a Veterans Memorial Park in my city, and I'll tell you, I drive by that thing every day. And, and I don't know exactly what yours is, but I'm telling you that thing is, it's, it's pure gold to our city. So, and I'm hoping you get the same for yours. So anyways, thank you. Thanks. Representative Bennett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I just like to say one thing, um, job well done. Thank you. Well then, I just have a few quick things to say myself and just in, in, in answer a little bit to some of the comments we made. Um, first of all, even though many of you would like more, uh, 825 million still is a lot of money. And um, I, we can't be, be, I can't guarantee that it's going to get bigger, even though there's a sentiment of many of you that it should. But don't approach that as a sure thing that's going to happen. Uh, Representative Sock, uh, I think those are some good suggestions. Um, I don't know if we'd ever get out of band one, but but that's something to certainly something to, to look at. Uh, you know, when we went around the state, uh, I tried and people to come to my office. I, I pretty much told everyone uh, that. You know, we have many, many more requests than we have money. And so there's no guarantee that uh, just because they come and ask for a project uh, that it's going to happen. Um, so I, we try to be, to be honest. And, you know, the governor, and certainly I've worked well with him over the years. I appreciate uh, what his job is, what he's trying to do. <clears throat> but when he says, uh, you know, where's the other half? Uh, when he's got a $1.5 billion uh, bonding proposal. Well, um, he does not have to get votes to pass his proposal. Um, I would frankly have uh, some serious uh, problems, uh, maybe not with you guys, <laughs> but over here at $1.5 billion. And uh, you know, it, it, this is a very complicated thing, as I, I know you appreciate to put together. And uh, we've, we've tried, I think, at 825, really 800, because 25 was carved out for us right away uh, to do what we can do. And you know, we'll look forward to continuing the process, however this takes us, to continue to try to do the best bill that we can. Because in the end, what we are trying to do is serve the needs of the people of Minnesota. You know, all other considerations aside, 
That's why we are here. That's why we are this committee. And that is what we're trying to do. And we will continue to try to do it uh, the best we can once again, uh, no matter where this process takes us. And so with that, I would certainly be remiss if I didn't uh, do some thank you as well. And so uh, first of all, our, our nonpartisan staff, Deb Dyson and uh, Andrew Lee, certainly appreciate all that you have done, not just this year, but for the many years you have served in this capacity. Uh, our staff, our, our pages, Emma Tadine. Back there, Emmett. Wave at us. There you go. Uh, CLA Jennifer uh, Goblish, uh, who keeps me in line much of the day. Yeah, that's good. Uh, speaking of keep people who keep me in line, the, the guy sitting next to me, uh, Gavin, who's done an excellent job, uh, and I I'm, I'm appreciate uh, you recognizing that and your comments to him as well. Uh, a researcher, a partisan researcher, uh, Jason Rector, uh, you know, I, all the members. I certainly uh, enjoy what you have done, and uh, it's been a pleasure working with you as a committee, uh, with with Alice uh, Hausman doing a, you know, a very good uh, in her role as uh, as lead uh, Democrat here, and uh, appreciate the the advice and the suggestions she gives me because uh, someone with her years of experience uh, in the role that I have right now should not uh, not be ignored. And uh, Jenny Nash, uh, also uh, thank you to Jenny for the work that she does, for the time that she has been uh, also involved with this committee. So uh, with that, all we have left to do is to do a vote, I think. So. Uh, we'd like to. Uh, I would like to renew my motion to pass uh, House File 4404 as amended to Ways and Means. Those in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Who did that? I did. Oh. Okay. <laughs> it's okay. It prevails. Thank you. <laughs> Who did that? Oh, wait, 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 wait. I didn't tell you to go. As Sergeant Preston would say, well, King, this case is closed. 